Chapter 19 of The Log of a Cowboy by Andy Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Forty Islands Ford. After securing a count on the herd that morning and finding nothing short, we trailed out up the North Platte River. It was an easy country in which to handle a herd. The trail in places would run back from the river as far as ten miles and again follow close in near the river bottoms. There was an abundance of small creeks putting into this fork of the Platte from the south, which afforded water for the herd and good campgrounds at night. Only twice after leaving Ogallala had we been compelled to go to the river for water for the herd, and with the exception of thunderstorms and occasional summer rains, the weather had been all one could wish. For the past week, as we trailed up the North Platte, some of us had visited the river daily to note its stage of water, for we were due to cross at Forty Islands, about twelve miles south of Old Fort Laramie. The North Platte was very similar to the South Canadian, a wide, sandy stream without banks, and our experience with the latter was fresh in our memories. The stage of water had not been favorable, for this river also had its source in the mountains, and as now midsummer was upon us, the season of heavy rainfall in the mountains, augmented by the melting snows, the prospect of finding affordable stage of water at Forty Islands was not very encouraging. We reached this well-known crossing late in the afternoon, the third day after leaving the Wyoming line, and found one of the Prairie Cattle Company's herds Waterbound. This herd had been wintered on one of that company's ranges on the Arkansas River in southern Colorado, and their destination was in the Badlands near the mouth of the Yellowstone, where the same company had a northern range. Flood knew the foreman, Wade Scholar, who reported having been waterbound over a week already with no prospect of crossing without swimming. Scholar knew the country thoroughly and had decided to lie over until the river was fordable at Forty Islands, as it was much the easiest crossing on the North Platte, though there was a wagon ferry at Fort Laramie. He returned with Flood to our camp, and the two talked over the prospect of swimming it on the morrow. "'Let's send the wagons up to the ferry in the morning,' said Flood, "'and swim the herds. If you wait until this river falls, you are liable to have an experience like we had on the South Canadian.' lost three days and bogged over a hundred cattle. When one of these sandy rivers has had a big freshet, look out for quicksands. But you know that as well as I do. Why, we've swum over a half a dozen rivers already, and I'd much rather swim this one than attempt to ford it just after it has fallen. We can double our outfits and be safely across before noon. I've got nearly a thousand miles yet to make, and have just got to get over. Think it over tonight, and have your wagon ready to start with ours. Scholar rode away without giving our foreman any definite answer as to what he would do, though earlier in the evening he had offered to throw his herd well out of the way at the ford and lend us any assistance at his command. But when it came to the question of crossing his own herd, he seemed to dread the idea of swimming the river and could not be induced to say what he would do, but said that we were welcome to the lead. The next morning Flood and I accompanied our wagon up to his camp, where it was plainly evident that he did not intend to send his wagon with ours, and McCann started on alone, though our foreman renewed his efforts to convince Scholar of the feasibility of swimming the herds. Their cattle were thrown well away from the ford, and Scholar assured us, that his outfit would be on hand whenever we were ready to cross, and even invited all hands of us to come to his wagon for dinner. When returning to our herd, Flood told me that Scholar was considered one of the best foremen on the trail, and why he should refuse to swim his cattle was unexplainable. He must have time to burn, but that doesn't seem reasonable, for the earlier through cattle were turned loose on their winter range the better. We were in no hurry to cross, as our wagon would be gone all day, and it was nearly high noon when we trailed up to the ford.
With the addition to our force of Scholar and nine or ten of his men, we had an abundance of help, and put the cattle into the water opposite two islands, our saddle horses in the lead as usual. There was no swimming water between the south shore and the first island, though it wet our saddle skirts for some considerable distance, this channel being nearly two hundred yards wide. Most of the outfit took the water, while Scholar's men fed our herd in from the south bank, a number of their men coming over as far as the first island. The second island lay down the stream some little distance, and as we pushed the cattle off the first one, we were in swimming water in no time. But the saddle horses were already landing on the second island, and our lead cattle struck out, and, breasting the water, swam as proudly as swans. The middle channel was nearly a hundred yards wide, the greater portion of which was swimming, though the last channel was much wider. But our saddle horses had already taken it, and within fifty yards of the farther shore struck solid footing. With our own outfit, we crowded the leaders to keep the chain of cattle unbroken, and before Honeyman could hustle his horses out of the river, our lead cattle had caught a foothold and were heading upstream and edging out for the farther shore. I had one of the best swimming horses in our outfit, and Flood put me in the lead on the point. As my horse came out on the farther bank, I am certain I have never seen a herd of cattle before or since which presented a prettier sight when swimming than ours did that day. There were fully four hundred yards of water on the angle by which we crossed, nearly half of which was swimming, but with the two islands, which gave them a breathing spell, our circle dots were taking the water as steadily as a herd leaving their bed ground. Scholar and his men were feeding them in, while half a dozen of our men on each island were keeping them moving. Honeyman and I pointed them out of the river, and as they grazed away from the shore, they spread out fan-like, many of them kicking up their heels after they left the water, in healthy enjoyment of their bath. Long before they were half over, the usual shouting had ceased, and we simply sat in our saddles and waited for the long train of cattle to come up and cross. Within less than a half an hour from the time our saddle horses entered the North Platte, the tail end of our herd had landed safely on the farther bank. As Honeyman and I were the only ones of our outfit on the north side of the river during the passage, Flood called to us from across the last channel, to graze the herd until relieved, when the remainder of the outfit returned to the south side to recover their discarded effects and to get dinner with Scholar's wagon. I had imitated Honeyman and tied my boots to my cantle strings so that my effects were on the right side of the river, and as far as dinner was concerned, well, I'd much rather miss it than swim the plat twice in its then stage of water. There is a difference in daring in one's duty and daring out of pure venturesomeness, and if we missed our dinners, it would not be the first time. So we were quite willing to make the sacrifice. If the Quirk family never achieve fame for daring by field and flood until this one of the old man boys brings the family name into prominence, it will be hopelessly lost to posterity. We allowed the cattle to graze of their own free will, and merely turned in the sides and rear. But on reaching the second bottom of the river, where they caught a good breeze, they lay down for their noonday siesta, which relieved us of all work but keeping watch over them. The saddle horses were grazing about in plain view on the first bottom, so Honeyman and I dismounted on a little elevation overlooking our charges. We were expecting the outfit to return promptly after dinner was over, for it was early enough in the day to have trailed eight or ten miles farther. It would have been no trouble to send someone up the river to meet our wagon and pilot McCann to the herd, for the trail left on a line due north from the river. We had been lounging about for an hour while the cattle were resting when our attention was attracted by our saddle horses in the bottom. They were looking at the ford, to which we supposed their attention had been attracted by the swimming of the outfit, but instead only two of the boys showed up, and on sighting us nearly a mile away, they rode forward very leisurely, 
Before their arrival, we recognized them by their horses as Ash, Borrowstone, and Rod Wheat. And on their riding up, the latter said as he dismounted, Well, they're going to cross the other herd, and they want you to come back and point the cattle with that famous swimming horse of yours. You'll learn after a while not to blow so much about your mount and your cutting horses and your night horses and your swimming horses. I wish every horse of mine had a nigger brand on him and I had to ride in the wagon when it comes to swimming these rivers. And I'm not the only one that is a distaste for wet proposition, for I wouldn't have to guess twice as to what's the matter with Scholar. But Flood has pounded him on the back ever since he met him yesterday evening to swim his cattle, until it's either swim or say he's afraid to. It's shoot Luke or give up the gun with him. Scholar's a nice fellow, but I'll bet my interest in Goose Heaven that I know what's the matter with him. And I'm not blaming him either, but I can't understand why our boss should take such an interest in having him swim. It's none of his business if he swims now, or, or for it's a month hence, or waits until the river freezes over in the winter and crosses on the ice. But let the big augers wrangle it out. You noticed, Ash, that not one of Scholar's outfit ever said a word one way or the other. But Flood poured it into him until he consented to swim. So fork that swimming horse of yours and wet your big toe again in the North Platte. As the orders had come from the foreman, there was nothing to do but obey. Honeyman rode as far as the river with me, where, after shedding my boots and surplus clothing and secreting them, I rode up above the island and plunged in. I was riding the gray which I had tried in the Rio Grande the day we received our herd, and now I understood handling him better. I preferred him to Nigger Boy, my night horse. We took the first and second islands with but a blowing spell between, and when I reached the farther shore, I turned in my saddle and saw Honeyman wave his hat to me in congratulation. On reaching their wagon, I found the herd was swinging around about a mile out from the river in order to get a straight shoot for the entrance at the ford. I hurriedly swallowed my dinner, and as we rode out to meet the herd, asked Flood if Scholar were not going to send his wagon up to the ferry to cross, for there was as yet no indication of it. Flood replied that Scholar expected to go with the wagon, as he needed some supplies which he thought he could get from the sutler at Fort Laramie. Flood ordered me to take the lower point again, and I rode across the trail and took my place when the herd came within a quarter mile of the river, while the remainder of the outfit took positions near the lead on the lower side. It was a slightly larger herd than ours, all steers, three-year-olds that reflected in their glossy coats the benefits of a northern winter. As we came up to the water's edge, it required two of their men to force their remuda into the water, though it was much smaller than ours, six horses to the man, but better ones than ours for being northern wintered. The cattle were well trail-broken and followed the leadership of the saddle horses nicely to the first island, but they would have balked at this second channel had it not been for the amount of help at hand. We lined them out, however, and they breasted the current and landed on the second island. The saddle horses gave some little trouble on leaving for the farther shore, and before they were got off, several hundred head of cattle had landed on the island. But they handled obediently and were soon trailing out upon terra firma, the herd following across without a broken link in the chain. There was nothing now to do but keep the train moving into the water on the south bank, see that they did not congest on the islands, and that they left the river on reaching the farther shore. When the saddle horses reached the farther bank, they were thrown up the river and turned loose, so that the two men would be available to hold the herd after it left the water. I had crossed with the first lead cattle to the farther shore, and was turning them up the river as fast as they struck solid footing on that side. But several times I was compelled to swim back to the nearest island and return with large bunches, which had hesitated to take the last channel. The two outfits were working promiscuously together, and I never knew 
who was the directing spirit in the work. But when the last two or three hundred of the tail-enders were leaving the first island for the second, and the men working in the rear started to swim the channel, amid the general hilarity, I recognized a shout that was born of fear and terror. A hushed silence fell over the riotous riders in the river, and I saw those on the sandbar nearest my side rush down the narrow island and plunge back into the middle channel. Then it dawned on my mind in a flash that someone had lost his seat, and that terrified cry was for help. I plunged my gray into the river and swam to the first bar, and from thence to the scene of the trouble. Horses and men were drifting with the current down the channel, and as I appealed to the men I could get no answer but their blanched faces, though it was plain in every countenance that one of our number was under water, if not drowned. There were not less than twenty horsemen drifting in the middle channel in hope that whoever it was would come to the surface and a hand could be stretched out in succor. About two hundred yards down the river was an island near the middle of the stream. The current carried us near it, and on landing, I learned that the unfortunate man was none other than Wade Scholar, the foreman of the herd. We scattered up and down this middle island, and watched every ripple and floating bit of flotsam, in hope that he would come to the surface. But nothing but his hat was seen. In the disorder into which the outfit were thrown by this accident, Flood first regained his thinking faculties and ordered a few of us to cross to either bank and ride down the river and take up positions on the other islands from which that part of the river took its name. A hundred conjectures were offered as to how it occurred, but no one saw either horse or rider after sinking. A free horse would be hard to drown, and on the non-appearance of Scholar's Mount it was concluded that he must have become entangled in the reins, or that Scholar had clutched them in his death grip, and the horse and man thus met death together. It was believed by his own outfit that Scholar had no intention until the last moment to risk swimming the river, but when he saw all others plunge into the channel, his better judgment was overcome, and rather than remain behind and cause comment, he had followed and lost his life. We patrolled the river until darkness without result, the two herds in the meantime having been so neglected that they had mixed. Our wagon returned along the north bank early in the evening, and Flood ordered priests to go in and make up a guard from the two outfits and hold the herd for the night. Someone of Scholar's outfit went back and moved their wagon up to the crossing, within hailing distance of ours. It was a night of muffled conversation, and every voice of the night or cry of waterfowl in the river sent creepy sensations over us. The long night passed, however, and the sun rose in Sabbath benediction, for it was Sunday, and found groups of men huddled around two wagons in silent contemplation of what the day before had brought a more broken and disconsolate set of men than scholars would be hard to imagine. Flood inquired of their outfit if there was any sub-foreman, or segundo, as they were generally called. It seemed there was not. But their outfit was unanimous that the leadership should fall to a boyhood acquaintance of scholars by the name of Campbell, who was generally addressed as Black Jim. Flood at once advised Campbell to send their wagon up to Laramie and cross it, promising that we would lie over that day and make an effort to recover the body of the drowned foreman. Campbell accordingly started his wagon up to the ferry, and all that remained of the outfits, with the exception of a few men on herd, started out in search of the drowned man. Within a mile and a half below the ford, there were located over thirty of the forty islands, and at the lower end of this chain of sandbars we began and searched both shores, while three or four men swam to each island and made a vigorous search. The water in the river was not very clear, which called for close inspection, but with a force of twenty-five men in the hunt, we covered island and shore rapidly in our search. 
It was about eight in the morning, and we had already searched half of the islands, when Joe Stallings and two of Scholar's men swam to an island in the river, which had a growth of small cottonwoods covering it, while on the upper end was a heavy logment of driftwood. John Officer, the Rebel, and I had taken the next island above, and as we were riding the shallows surrounding it, we heard a shot in our rear that told us the body had been found. As we turned in the direction of the signal, Stallings was standing on a large driftwood log and signaling. We started back to him, partly wading and partly swimming, while from both sides of the river men were swimming their horses for the brushy island. Our squad, on nearing the lower bar, was compelled to swim around the driftwood, and some twelve or fifteen men from either shore reached the scene before us. The body was lying face upward in about eighteen inches of eddy water. Flood and Campbell waded out, and taking a lariat, fastened it around his chest under the arms. Then Flood, noticing I was riding my black, asked me to tow the body ashore. Forcing a passage through the driftwood, I took the loose end of the lariat and started for the north bank, the double outfit following. On reaching the shore, the body was carried out of the water by willing hands, and one of our outfit was sent to the wagon for a tarpaulin to be used as a stretcher. Meanwhile, Campbell took possession of the drowned foreman's watch, six-shooter, purse, and papers. The watch was as good as ruined, but the leather holster had shrunk and securely held the gun from being lost in the river. On the arrival of the tarpaulin, the body was laid upon it, and four mounted men, taking the four corners of the sheet, wrapped them on the pommels of their saddles and started for our wagon. When the corpse had been lowered to the ground at our camp, a look of inquiry passed from face to face which seemed to ask, What next? But the inquiry was answered a moment later by Black Jim Campbell, the friend of the dead man. Memory may have dimmed the lesser details of that Sunday morning on the North Platte, for over two decades have since gone, but his words and manliness have lived, not only in my mind, but in the memory of every other survivor of those present. This accident, said he in perfect composure, as he gazed into the calm, still face of his dead friend, will impose upon me a very sad duty. I expect to meet his mother some day. She will want to know everything. I must tell her the truth. And I'd hate to tell her we buried him like a dog, for she's a Christian woman. And, what makes it all the harder, I know that this is the third boy she has lost by drowning. Some of you may not have understood him, but among those papers which you saw me take from his pockets was a letter from his mother in which she warned him to guard against just what has happened. Situated as we are, I'm going to ask you all to help me give him the best burial we can. No doubt it will be crude, but it will be some solace to her to know we did the best we could. Every one of us was eager to lend his assistance. Within five minutes, Priest was galloping up the north bank of the river to intercept the wagon at the ferry, a well-filled purse in his pocket with which to secure a coffin at Fort Laramie. Flood and Campbell selected a burial place, and with our wagon spade a grave was being dug on a nearby grassy mound, where there were two other graves. There was not a man among us who was hypocrite enough to attempt to conduct a Christian burial service. But when the subject came up, McCann said, as he came down the river the evening before, he noticed an immigrant train of about thirty wagons going into camp at a grove about five miles up the river. In a conversation which he had had with one of the party, he learned that they expected to rest over Sunday. Their respect for the Sabbath day caused Campbell to suggest that there might be someone in the immigrant camp who could conduct a Christian burial and he at once mounted his horse and rode away to learn. In preparing the body for its last resting place, we were badly handicapped. 
but by tearing a new wagon sheet into strips about a foot in width and wrapping the body, we gave it a humble bier in the shade of our wagon, pending the arrival of the coffin. The features were so ashen by having been submerged in the river for over eighteen hours that we wrapped the face also. As we preferred to remember him as we had seen him the day before, strong, healthy, and buoyant. During the interim, awaiting the return of Campbell from the immigrant camp and of the wagon, we sat around in groups and discussed the incident. There was a sense of guilt expressed by a number of our outfit over their hasty decision regarding the courage of the dead man. When we understood that two of his brothers had met a similar fate in Red River within the past five years, every guilty thought or hasty word spoken came back to us with tenfold weight. Priest and Campbell returned together. The former reported having secured a coffin which would arrive within an hour, while the latter had met in the immigrant camp a supernumerated minister who gladly volunteered his services. He had given the old minister such data as he had, and two of the minister's granddaughters had expressed a willingness to assist by singing at the burial service. Campbell had set the hour for four, and several conveyances would be down from the immigrant camp. The wagon arriving shortly afterward, we had barely time to lay the corpse in the coffin before the immigrants drove up. The minister was a tall, homely man with a flowing beard, which the frosts of many a winter had whitened, and as he mingled amongst us in the final preparations, he had a kind word for every one. There were ten in his party, and when the coffin had been carried out to the grave, the two granddaughters of the old man opened the simple service by singing very impressively the first three verses of the Portuguese hymn. I had heard the old hymn sung often before, but the impression of the last verse rang in my ears for days afterwards. When through the deep waters I call thee to go, the rivers of sorrow shall not overflow. For I will be with thee thy troubles to bless, and sanctify to thee thy deepest distress. As the notes of the hymn died away, there were a few moments of profound stillness, and not a move was made by anyone. The touching words of the old hymn expressed quite vividly the disaster of the previous day, and awakened in us many memories of home. For a time we were silent, while eyes unused to weeping filled with tears. I do not know how long we remained so. It may have been only for a moment, it probably was, but I do know the silence was not broken till the aged minister, who stood at the head of the coffin, began his discourse. We stood with uncovered heads during the service. And when the old minister addressed us, he spoke as though he might have been holding family worship, and we had been his children. He invoked heaven to comfort and sustain the mother when the news of her son's death reached her as she would need more than human aid in that hour. He prayed that her faith might not falter, that she might again meet and be with her loved ones forever in the great beyond. He then took up the subject of life, spoke of its brevity, its many hopes that are never realized, and the disappointments from which no prudence or foresight can shield us. He dwelt at some length on the strange mingling of sunshine and shadow that seemed to belong to every life, of the mystery everywhere, and nowhere more impressively than in ourselves. With his long, bony finger, he pointed to the cold, mute form that lay in the coffin before us, and said, But this, my friends, is the mystery of all mysteries. The fact that life terminated in death, he said, only emphasized its reality, that the death of our companion was not an accident, though it was sudden and unexpected, that the difficulties of life are such that it would be worse than folly in us to try and meet them in our own strength. Death, he said, might change, but it did not destroy, that the soul still lived and would live forever 
that death was simply the gateway out of time into eternity. And if we were to realize the high aim of our being, we could do so by casting our burdens on him who was able and willing to carry them for us. He spoke feelingly of the great teacher, the lowly Nazarene, who also suffered and died, and he concluded with an eloquent description of the blessed life, the immortality of the soul, and the resurrection of the body. After the discourse was ended, and a brief earnest prayer was covered, the two young girls sang the hymn, Shall We Meet Beyond the River? The services being at an end, the coffin was lowered into the grave. Campbell thanked the old minister and his two granddaughters on their taking leave for their presence and assistance, and a number of us boys also shook hands with the old man at parting. End of chapter 19「the remainder holding the main herd and looking after the cut. The morning was cool, everyone worked with a vim, and in about two hours the herds were again separated and ready for the final trimming. Campbell did not expect to move out until he could communicate with the head office of the company and would go up to Fort Laramie for that purpose during the day, hoping to be able to get a message over the military wire. When his outfit had finished retrimming our herd, and we had looked over his cattle for the last time, the two outfits bade each other farewell, and our herd started on its journey. The unfortunate accident at the ford had depressed our feelings to such an extent that there was an entire absence of hilarity, by the way. This morning, the farewell songs generally used in parting with a river which had defied us were omitted. The herd trailed out like an immense serpent, and was guided and controlled by our men as if by mutes. Long before the noon hour we passed out of sight of Forty Islands, and in the next few days, with the change of scene, the gloom gradually lifted. We were bearing almost due north, and passing through a delightful country. To our left ran a range of mountains, while on the other hand, sloped off the apparently limitless plain. The scarcity of water was beginning to be felt, for the streams, which had not a source in the mountains on our left, had dried up weeks before our arrival. There was a gradual change of air noticeable, too, for we were rapidly gaining altitude, and the heat of the summer being now confined to a few hours at noonday, while the nights were almost too cool for our comfort. When about three days out from the North Platte, the mountains disappeared on our left, while on the other hand appeared a rugged-looking country, which we knew must be the approaches of the Black Hills. Another day's drive brought us into the main stage road connecting the railroad on the south with the mining camps which nestled somewhere in those rocky hills to our right. The stage road followed the trail for some ten or fifteen miles before we parted company with it, on a dry fork of the big Cheyenne River. There was a roadhouse and a stage stand, where these two thoroughfares separated, the one to the mining camp of Deadwood, while ours, of the Montana Cattle Trail, bore off for the Powder River to the northwest. At this stage stand, we learned that some twenty herds had already passed by to the northern ranges, and that after passing the next fork of the big Cheyenne, we should find no water until we struck the Powder River, a stretch of eighty miles. The keeper of the roadhouse, a genial host, informed us that this droughty stretch in our front was something unusual, this being one of the driest summers that he had experienced, 
since the discovery of gold in the Black Hills. Here was a new situation to be met, an eighty-mile dry drive, and with our experience of a few months before at Indian Lakes fresh in our memories, we set our house in order for the undertaking before us. It was yet fifteen miles to the next and last water from the stage stand. There were several dry forks of the Cheyenne beyond, but as they had their source in the tablelands of Wyoming, we could not hope for water in their dry bottoms. The situation was serious, with only this encouragement. Other herds had crossed this arid belt since the streams had dried up, and our circle dots could walk with any herd that ever left Texas. The wisdom of mounting us well for just such an emergency reflected the good cow sense of our employer, and we felt easy in regard to our mounts, though there was not a horse or a man too many. In summing up the situation, Flood said, We've got this advantage over the Indian Lake Drive. There is a good moon, and the days are cool. We'll make twenty-five miles a day covering this stretch, as this herd has never been put to a test yet to see how far they could walk in a day. They'll have to do their sleeping at noon. At least cut it into two shifts, and if we get any sleep, we'll have to do the same. Let her come as she will. Every day's drive is a day nearer the Blackfoot Agency. We made a dry camp that night on the divide between the roadhouse and the last water, and the next forenoon reached the south fork of the Big Cheyenne. The water was not even running in it, but there were several long pools, and we held the cattle around them for over an hour until every hoof had been thoroughly watered. McCann had filled every keg and canteen in advance of the arrival of the herd, and Flood had exercised sufficient caution, in view of what lay before us, to buy an extra keg and a bull's-eye lantern at the roadhouse. After watering, we trailed out some four or five miles and camped for noon, but the herd were allowed to graze forward until they lay down for their noonday rest. As the herd passed opposite the wagon, we cut out a fat two-year-old stray heifer and killed her for beef, for the inner man must be fortified for the journey before us. After a two hours' siesta, we threw the herd on the trail and started on our way. The wagon and saddle horses were held in our immediate rear, for there was no telling when or where we would make our next halt of any consequence. We trailed and grazed the herd alternately until near evening, when the wagon was sent on ahead about three miles to get supper, while half the outfit went along to change mounts and catch up horses for those remaining behind with the herd. A half hour before the usual bedding time, the relieved men returned and took the grazing herd, and the others rode into the wagon for supper and a change of mounts. While we shifted our saddles, we smelled the savory odor of fresh beef frying. "'Listen to that good old beef talking, will you?' said Joe Stallings, as he was bridling his horse. "'McCann, I'll take my carne fresco a trifle rare tonight, garnished with a sprig of parsley and a wee bit of lemon.' Before we had finished supper, Honeyman had rehooked the mules to the wagon, while the remuda was at hand to follow. Before we left the wagon, a full moon was rising on the eastern horizon, and, as we were starting out, Flood gave us these general directions. "'I'm going to take the lead with the cook's lantern, and one of you rear men take the new bull's-eye. We'll throw the herd on the trail, and between the lead and the rear light, you swingmen want to ride well outside, and you pointmen want to hold the lead cattle so the rear will never be more than a half a mile behind. I'll admit that this is somewhat of an experiment with me, but I don't see any good reason why she won't work. After the moon gets another hour high, we can see a quarter of a mile, and the cattle are so well trail broke that they'll never try to scatter. If it works all right, we'll never bed them short of midnight, and that will put us ten miles farther. Let's ride, lads. By the time the herd was eased back on the trail, our evening campfire had been passed, while the cattle led out as if walking on a wager. After the first mile on the trail, 
The men on the point were compelled to ride in the lead if we were to hold them within the desired half mile. The men on the other side, or the swing, were gradually widening until the herd must have reached fully a mile in length. Yet we swing riders were never out of sight of each other. It would have been impossible for any cattle to leave the herd unnoticed. In that moonlight the trail was as plain as day, and after an hour Flood turned his lantern over to one of the point men and rode back around the herd to the rear. From my position, that first night near the middle of the swing, the lanterns, both rear and forward, being always in sight, I was as much at sea as anyone as to the length of the herd, knowing the deceitfulness of distance of campfires and other lights by night. The foreman appealed to me as he rode down the column to know the length of the herd, but I could give him no more than a simple guess. I could assure him, however, that the cattle had made no effort to drop out and leave the trail. But a short time after he passed me, I noticed a horseman galloping up the column on the opposite side of the herd and knew it must be the foreman. Within a short time, someone in the lead wigwagged his lantern. It was answered by the light in the rear. And the next minute, the old rear song, Lippy la go, go along, little doggie. You'll make a beef steer by and by, reached us riders in the swing, and we knew the rear guard of cattle was being pushed forward. The distance between the swing men gradually narrowed in our lead, from which we could tell the leaders were being held in, until several times cattle grazed out from the herd, due to the checking in front. At this juncture, Flood galloped around the herd a second time, and as he passed us riding along our side, I appealed to him to let them go in front, as it now required constant riding to keep the cattle from leaving the trail to graze. When he passed up the other side, I could distinctly hear the men on that flank making a similar appeal, and shortly afterwards the herd loosened out, and we struck our old gate for several hours. Trailing by moonlight was a novelty to all of us, and in the stillness of those splendid July nights we could hear the point men chattering across the lead in front, while well in the rear the rattling of our heavily loaded wagon and the whistling of the horse wrangler to his charges reached our ears. The swingmen were scattered so far apart there was no chance for conversation amongst us, but every once in a while a song would be started, and as it surged up and down the line every voice, good, bad, and indifferent, joined in. Singing is supposed to have a soothing effect on cattle, though I will vouch for the fact that none of our circle dots stopped that night to listen to our vocal efforts. The herd was traveling so nicely that our foreman hardly noticed the passing hours. But along about midnight the singing ceased, and we were nodding in our saddles and wondering if they in the lead were never going to throw off the trail, when a great wigwagging occurred in front, and presently we overtook the rebel, holding the lantern and turning the herd out of the trail. It was then after midnight, and within another half hour we had the cattle bedded down within a few hundred yards of the trail. One hour guards was the order of the night, and as soon as our wagon and saddle horses came up, we stretched ropes and caught out our night horses. These we either tied to the wagon wheels or picketed near at hand, and then we sought our blankets for a few hours' sleep. It was half past three in the morning when our guard was called, and before the hour passed, the first signs of day were visible in the east. But even before our watch had ended, Flood and the last guard came to our relief, and we pushed the sleeping cattle off the bed ground and started them grazing forward. Cattle will not graze freely in a heavy dew or too early in the morning, and before the sun was high enough to dry the grass, we had put several miles behind us. When the sun was about an hour high, the remainder of the outfit overtook us, and shortly afterward the wagon and saddle horses passed on up the trail, from which it was evident that breakfast would be served in the dining car ahead, as the traveled priest aptly put it. After the sun was well up, the cattle grazed freely for several hours, but when we sighted the remuda and our commissary some two miles in our lead, Flood ordered the herd lined up for a count. 
The rebel was always a reliable counter, and he and the foreman now rode forward and selected the crossing of a dry wash for the counting. On receiving their signal to come on, we allowed the herd to graze slowly forward, but gradually pointing them into an immense V, and as the point of the herd crossed the dry arroyo, we compelled them to pass in a narrow file between the two counters, when they again spread out fan-like and continued their feeding. The count confirmed the success of our driving by night, and on its completion all but two men rode to the wagon for breakfast. By the time the morning meal was disposed of, the herd had come up parallel with the wagon, but a mile to the westward, and as fast as fresh mounts could be saddled, we rode away in small squads to relieve the herders and to turn the cattle into the trail. It was but a little after eight o'clock in the morning when the herd was again trailing out on the Powder River Trail, and we had already put thirty miles of the dry drive behind us, while so far neither horse nor cattle had been put to any extra exertion. The wagon followed as usual, and for over three hours we held the trail without a break, when, sighting a divide in our front, the foreman went back and sent the wagon around the herd with instructions to make the noon camp well up on the divide. We threw the herd off the trail, within a mile of this stopping place, and allowed them to graze, while two-thirds of our outfit galloped away to the wagon. We allowed the cattle to lie down and rest to their complete satisfaction until the middle of the afternoon, Meanwhile, all hands, with the exception of two men on herd, also lay down and slept in the shade of the wagon. When the cattle had had several hours' sleep, the want of water made them restless, and they began to rise and graze away. Then all hands were aroused, and we threw them upon the trail. The heat of the day was already over, and until the twilight of the evening, we trailed a three-mile clip and again threw the herd off to graze. By our traveling and grazing gates, we could form an approximate idea as to the distance we had covered, and the consensus of opinion of all was that we had already killed over half the distance. The herd was beginning to show the want of water by evening, but amongst our saddle horses the lack of water was more noticeable, as a horse subsisting on grass alone weakens easily, and riding them made them all the more gaunt. When we caught up our mounts that evening, we had used eight horses to the man since we had left the South Fork, and another one would be required at midnight, or whenever we halted. We made our drive the second night with more confidence than the one before, but there were times when the train of cattle must have been nearly two miles in length. Yet there was never a halt as long as the man with the lead light could see the one in the rear. We bet at the herd about midnight, and at first break of day, the fourth guard with the foreman joined our watch, and we started the cattle again. There was a light dew the second night, and the cattle, hungered by their night walk, went to grazing at once on the damp grass, which would allay their thirst slightly. We allowed them to scatter over several thousand acres, for we were anxious to graze them well before the sun absorbed the moisture but at the same time every step they took was one less to the coveted Powder River. When we had grazed the herd forward several miles, and the sun was nearly an hour high, the wagon failed to come up, which caused our foreman some slight uneasiness. Nearly another hour passed, and still the wagon did not come up, nor did the outfit put in an appearance. Soon afterwards, however, Moss Strayhorn overtook us, and reported that over forty of our saddle horses were missing, while the work mules had been overtaken nearly five miles back on the trail. On account of my ability as a trailer, Flood at once dispatched me to assist Honeyman in recovering the missing horses, instructing someone else to take the remuda and the wagon and horses to follow up the herd. By the time I arrived, most of the boys at camp had secured a change of horses, and I caught up my grula, that I was saving for the last hard ride, for the horse hunt which confronted us. McCann, having no fire built, gave Honeyman and myself an impromptu breakfast and two canteens of water. 
But before we let the wagon get away, we rustled a couple cans of tomatoes and buried them in a cache near the campground, where we would have no trouble in finding them on our return. As the wagon pulled out, we mounted our horses and rode back down the trail. Billy Honeyman understood horses, and at once volunteered the belief that we would have a long ride overtaking the missing saddle stock. The absent horses, he said, were principally the ones which had been under saddle the day before, and, as we both knew, a tired, thirsty horse will go miles for water. He recalled also that while we were asleep at noon the day before, twenty miles back on the trail, the horses had found quite a patch of wild sorrel plant, and were foolish over leaving it. Both of us being satisfied that this would hold them for several hours at least, we struck a free gait for it. After we passed the point where the mules had been overtaken, the trail of the horses was distinct enough for us to follow in an easy canter. We saw frequent signs that they left the trail, no doubt to graze, but only for short distances, when they would enter it again and keep it for miles. Shortly before noon, we gained the divide above our noon camp of the day before, and there, about two miles distance, we saw our missing horses, feeding over an alkali flat on which grew wild sorrel and other species of sour plants. We rounded them up, and finding none missing, we first secured a change of mounts. The only two horses of my mount in this portion of the Remuda had both been under saddle the afternoon and night before, and were as gaunt as rails. Honeyman had one unused horse of his mount in the hand. So, when taking down our ropes, we halted the horses and began riding slowly around them, forcing them into a compact body. I had my eye on a brown horse of floods that had not had a saddle on in a week, and told Billy to fasten to him if he got a chance. This was in violation of all custom, but if the foreman kicked, I had a good excuse to offer. Honeyman was left-handed and threw a rope splendidly, and as we circled around the horses on opposite sides, on signal from him we whirled our lariats and made casts simultaneously. The wrangler fastened to the brown I wanted, and my loop settled around the neck of his unridden horse. As the band broke away from our swinging ropes, a number of them ran afoul of my rope, but I gave the rowel to my grulla, and we shook them off. When I returned the honeyman, we had exchanged horses and were shifting our saddles. I complimented him on the long throw he had made in catching the brown, and incidentally mentioned that I had read of vaqueros in California who used a sixty-five-foot lariat. Hell, said Billy, in ridicule of the idea, there wasn't a man ever born who could throw a sixty-five-foot rope its full length without he threw it down a well. The sun was straight overhead when we started back to overtake the herd. We struck into a little better than a five-mile gait on the return trip, and about two o'clock sighted a band of saddle horses and a wagon camped perhaps a mile forward and to the side of the trail. On coming near enough, we saw at a glance it was a cow outfit, and after driving our loose horses a good push beyond their camp, we turned and rode back to their wagon. "'We'll give them a chance to ask us to eat,' said Billy to me, "'and if they don't, why... They'll miss a hell of a good chance to entertain hungry men. But the foreman with the stranger wagon proved to be a B County Texan, and our doubts did him an injustice. For although dinner was over, he invited us to dismount and ordered his cook to set out something to eat. They had met our wagon, and McCann had insisted on their taking a quarter of our beef, so we fared well. The outfit was from a ranch near Miles City, Montana and were going down to receive a herd of cattle at Cheyenne, Wyoming. The cattle had been bought at Ogallala for delivery at the former point, and this wagon was going down with their ranch outfit to take the herd on its arrival. They had brought along about seventy-five saddle horses from the ranch, though in buying the herd they had taken its remuda of over a hundred saddle horses. The foreman informed us that they had met our cattle about the middle of the forenoon, nearly twenty-five miles out from Powder River. After we had satisfied the inner man, 
We lost no time getting off, as we could see a long ride ahead of us. But we had occasion, as we rode away, to go through their remuda to cut out a few of our horses which had mixed, and I found I knew over a dozen of their horses by the ranch brands, while Honeyman also recognized quite a few. Though we felt a pride in our mounts, we had to admit that theirs were better, for the effect of climate had transformed horses that we had once ridden on ranches in southern Texas. It does seem incredible, but it is a fact, nevertheless, that a horse, having reached the years of maturity in a southern climate, will grow half a hand taller and carry two hundred pounds more flesh when he has undergone the rigors of several northern winters. We halted at our night camp to change horses and to unearth our cached tomatoes, and again set out. By then it was so late in the day that the sun had lost its force, and on this last leg, in overtaking the herd, we increased our gait steadily until the sun was scarcely an hour high, and yet we never sighted a dust cloud in our front. About sundown we called a few minutes halt, and after eating our tomatoes and drinking the last of our water, again pushed on. Twilight had faded into dusk before we reached the divide which we had had in sight for several hours, and which we had hoped to gain in time to sight the timber on Powder River before dark. But as we put mile after mile behind us, the divide seemed to move away like a mirage, and the evening star had been shining for an hour before we finally reached it, and sighted, instead of Powder's timber, the campfire of our outfit about five miles ahead. We fired several shots on seeing the light, in hope that they might hear us in camp and wait. Otherwise, we knew they would start the herd with the rising of the moon. When we finally reached camp about nine o'clock at night, everything was in readiness to start, the moon having risen sufficiently. Our shooting, however, had been heard, and horses for a change were tied to the wagon wheels, while the remainder of the remuda was under herd in charge of rod wheat. The runaways were thrown into the horse herd while we bolted our suppers. Meantime, McCann informed us that Flood had ridden that afternoon to the Powder River in order to get the lay of the land. He had found it to be ten or twelve miles distant from the present camp, and the water in the river barely knee-deep to a saddle horse. Beyond it was a fine valley. Before we started, Flood rode in from the herd and said to Honeyman, I'm going to send the horses and wagon ahead tonight, and you and McCann want to camp on this side of the river, under the hill, and just a few hundred yards below the ford. Throw your saddle horses across the river and build a fire before you go to sleep, so we will have a beacon light to pilot us in, in case the cattle break into a run on scenting the water. The herd will get in a little after midnight, and after crossing, we'll turn her loose just for luck. It did me good to hear the foreman say that the herd was to be turned loose, for I had been in the saddle since three that morning, and had ridden over eighty miles, and now had ten more in sight, while Honeyman would complete the day with over a hundred to his credit. We let the remuda take the lead in pulling out, so that the wagon mules could be spurred to their utmost in keeping up with the loose horses. Once they were clear of the herd, we let the cattle into the trail, they had refused to bed down, for they were uneasy with thirst, but the cool weather had saved them any serious suffering. We all felt gala as the herd strung out on the trail. Before we halted again, there would be water for our dumb brutes and rest for ourselves. There was lots of singing that night. There's one more river to cross, and roll, powder, roll, were wafted out on the night air to the coyotes that howled on our flanks, or to the prairie dogs as they peeped from their burrows at this weird caravan of the night, and the lights which flickered in our front and rear must have been real jack-o'-lanterns or will-o'-the-wisps to these occupants of the plain. Before we had covered half the distance, the herd was strung out over two miles, and as Flood rode back to the rear every half hour or so, he showed no inclination to check the lead and give the sore-footed rear guard a chance to close up the column. But about an hour before midnight, we saw a light low down in our front, which gradually increased 
until the treetops were distinctly visible, and we knew that our wagon had reached the river. On sighting this beacon, the long yell went up and down the column, and the herd walked as only long-legged, thirsty Texas cattle can walk when they scent water. Flood called all the swingmen to the rear, and we threw out a half-circle skirmish line covering a mile in width, so far back that only an occasional glimmer of the lead light could be seen. The trail struck the powder on an angle, and when within a mile of the river, the swing cattle left the deep-trodden paths and started for the nearest water. The left flank of our skirmish line encountered the cattle as they reached the river and prevented them from drifting up the stream. The pointmen abandoned the leaders when within a few hundred yards of the river. Then the rear guard of cripples and sore-footed cattle came up, and the two flanks of horsemen pushed them all across the river until they met when we turned and galloped into camp making the night hideous with our yelling. The longest dry drive of the trip had been successfully made, and we all felt jubilant. We stripped bridles and saddles from our tired horses, and unrolling our beds were soon lost in well-earned sleep. The stars may have twinkled overhead, and sundry voices of the night may have whispered to us as we lay down to sleep, but we were too tired for poetry or sentiment that night. End of chapter 20。Chapter 21 of The Log of a Cowboy by Andy Adams。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。The Yellowstone。The tramping of our remuda as they came trotting up to the wagon the next morning and Honeyman's calling, Horses, Horses, brought us to the realization that another day had dawned with its duty. McCann had stretched the ropes of our corral, for Flood was as dead to the world as any of us were. But the trampling of over a hundred and forty horses and mules, as they crowded inside the ropes, brought him into action, as well as the rest of us. We had had a good five hours' sleep, while our mounts had been transformed from gaunt animals to round-barreled saddle-horses that fought and struggled amongst themselves or artfully dodged the lariat loops which were being cast after them, Honeyman reported the herd quietly grazing across the river, and after securing our mounts for the morning, we breakfasted before looking after the cattle. It took us less than an hour to round up and count the cattle, and then turn them loose again, under herd to graze. Those of us not on herd returned to the wagon, and our foreman instructed McCann to make a two hours drive down the river and camp for noon, as he proposed only to graze the herd that morning. After seeing the wagon safely beyond the rocky crossing, we hunted up a good bathing pool and disported ourselves for half an hour, taking a much needed bath. There were trails on either side of the powder, and as our course was henceforth to the northwest, we remained on the west side and grazed or trailed down it. It was a beautiful stream of water, having its source in the Bighorn Mountains, frequently visible on our left. For the next four or five days we had easy work. There were range cattle through that section, but fearful of Texas fever, their owners gave the Powder River a wide berth. With the exception of holding the herd at night, our duties were light. We caught fish and killed grouse, and the respite seemed like a holiday after our experience of the past few days. During the evening of the second day, after reaching the powder, we crossed the Crazy Woman, a clear mountain fork of the former river, and nearly as large as the parent stream. Once or twice we encountered range riders, and learned that the Crazy Woman was a stock country, a number of beef ranches being located on it, stocked with Texas cattle. Somewhere near or about the Montana line, we took a left-hand trail. Flood had ridden it out until he had satisfied himself that it led over to the Tongue River and the country beyond. While large trails followed on down the powder, their direction was wrong for us, as they led us towards the Badlands and the lower Yellowstone country. On the second day out, 
After taking the left-hand trail, we encountered some rough country in passing across the saddle in a range of hills forming the divide between the Powder and the Tongue Rivers. We were nearly a whole day crossing it, but had a well-used trail to follow, and down in the foothills made camp that night on a creek which emptied into the Tongue. The roughness of the trail was well compensated for, however, as it was a paradise of grass and water. We reached the Tongue River the next afternoon, and found it in a similar stream to the powder, clear as crystal, swift, and with a rocky bottom. As these were but minor rivers, we encountered no trouble in crossing them, the greatest danger being to our wagon. On the Tongue we met range riders again, and from them we learned that this trail— which crossed the Yellowstone at Frenchman's Ford, was the one in use by herds bound for the Muscle Shell and remoter points on the upper Missouri. From one rider we learned that the first herd of the present season, which went through on this route, were cattle wintered on the Neobara in western Nebraska, whose destination was Alberta in the British possessions. This herd outclassed us in penetrating northward, though in distance they had not traveled half as far as our circle dots. After following the Tongue River several days, and coming out on that immense plain tributary to the Yellowstone, the trail turned to the northwest, gave us a short day's drive to the Rosebud River, and after following it a few miles, bore off again on the same quarter. In our rear hung the mountains with their sentinel peaks, while in our front stretched the valley tributary to the Yellowstone, in extent itself an inland empire. The month was August, and with the exception of cool nights, no complaint could be made, for that rarefied atmosphere was a tonic to man and beast, and there was pleasure in the primitive freshness of the country which rolled away on every hand. On leaving the Rosebud, two days' travel brought us to the east fork of Sweetgrass, an insignificant stream with a swift current and rocky crossing. In the first two hours after reaching it, we must have crossed it a half a dozen times, following the grassy bottoms, which shifted from one bank to the other. When we were full forty miles distant from Frenchman Ford on the Yellowstone, the wagon, in crossing Sweetgrass, went down a siding bank into the bottom of the creek. The left hind wheel collided with a boulder in the water, dishing it, and every spoke in the wheel snapped off at the shoulder in the fellow. McCann never noticed it, and poured the whip into the mules, and when he pulled out on the opposite bank, left the fellow of his wheel in the creek behind. The herd was in the lead at the time, and when Honeyman overtook us and reported the accident, we threw the herd off to graze, and over half the outfit returned to the wagon. When we reached the scene, McCann had recovered the fellow, but every spoke in the hub was hopelessly ruined. Flood took in the situation at a glance. He ordered the wagon unloaded, and the reach lengthened, took the axe, and with rebel, went back about a mile to a thicket of lodge poles which we had passed higher up the creek. While the rest of us unloaded the wagon, McCann, who was swearing by both notes and rhyme, unearthed his saddle from amongst the other plunder and cinched it on his nigh-wheeler. We had the wagon unloaded, and had reloaded some of the heaviest of the plunder in the front end of the wagon box, by the time our foreman and priest returned, dragging from their pommels a thirty-foot pole as perfect as the mast of a yacht. We knocked off all the spokes not already broken at the hub of the ruined wheel, and, after jacking up the hind axle, attached the crutch. By cutting a half-notch in the larger end of the pole, so that it fitted over the front axle, lashing it there securely, and allowing the other end to trail behind on the ground, we devised a support on which the hub of the broken wheel rested, almost at its normal height. There was sufficient spring to the pole to obviate any jolt or jar, while the rearrangement we had effected in distributing the load would relieve it of any serious burden." We took a rope from the coupling pole of the wagon and loosely noosed it over the crutch, which allowed leeway in turning, but prevented the hub from slipping off the support on a short turn to the left. Then we lashed the tire and fellow to the front end of the wagon, 
and, with the loss of but a couple of hours, our commissary was again on the move. The trail followed the sweet grass down to the Yellowstone, and until we reached it, whenever there was a creek to ford or extra pulls on hills, half a dozen of us would drop back and lend a hand from our saddle pommels. The gradual decline of the country to the river was in our favor at present, and we should reach the ford in two days at the farthest, where we hoped to find a wheelwright. In case we did not, our foreman thought he could effect a trade for a serviceable wagon, as ours was a new one and the best make in the market. The next day Flood rode on ahead to Frenchman's Ford, and late in the day returned with the information that the Ford was quite a pretentious frontier village of the squatter type. There was a blacksmith and a wheelwright shop in the town, but the prospect of an exchange was discouraging, as the wagons there were of the heavy freighting type, while ours was a wide tread, a serious objection, as wagons manufactured for the southern trade were eight inches wider than those used in the north, and therefore would not track on the same road. The wheelwright had assured Flood that the wheel could be filled in a day, with the exception of painting, and, as paint was not important, he had decided to move up within three or four miles of the ford and lie over a day for repairing the wagon and at the same time have our mules reshod. Accordingly, we moved up the next morning, and after unloading the wagon, both box and contents, over half the outfit, the first and second guards, accompanied the wagon into the ford. They were to return by noon, when the remainder of us were to have our turn in seeing the sights of Frenchman's ford. The horse wrangler remained behind with us, to accompany the other half of the outfit in the afternoon. The herd was no trouble to hold, and after watering about the middle of the forenoon, three of us went into camp and got dinner. As this was the first time since starting that our cook was absent, we rather enjoyed the opportunity to practice our culinary skill. Pride in our ability to cook was a weakness in our craft. The work was divided up between Joe Stallings, John Officer, and myself, Honeyman being excused on agreeing to rustle the wood and water. Stallings prided himself on being an artist in making coffee, and while hunting for the coffee mill, found a bag of dried peaches. "'Say, fellas,' said Joe, "'I'll bet McCann has hauled this fruit a thousand miles and never knew he had it amongst all this plunder. I'm going to stew a saucepan full of it, just to show his royal nibs that he's been thoughtless of his borders.' Officer volunteered to cut and fry the meat, for we were eating stray beef now with great regularity, and the making of the biscuits fell to me. Honeyman soon had a fire so big that you could not have got near it without a wet blanket on, and when my biscuits were ready for the Dutch oven, Officer threw a bucket of water on the fire, remarking, Honeyman, if you was Kusi Segundo under me and build up such a big fire for the chef, there would be trouble in camp. You may be a good enough horse wrangler for a through Texas outfit, but when it comes to playing second fiddle to a cook of my accomplishments, well, you simply don't know salt from wild honey. A man might as well try to cook on a burning haystack as on a fire of your building. When the fire had burned down sufficiently, the cooks got their respective utensils upon the fire. I had an ample supply of live coals for the Dutch oven, and dinner was shortly afterwards announced as ready. After dinner, Officer and I relieved the men on herd, but over an hour passed before we caught sight of the first and second guards returning from the ford. They were men who could stay in town all day and enjoy themselves, but as Flood had reminded them, there were others who were entitled to a holiday. When Bob Blades and Fox Quarternight came to our relief on herd, they attempted to detain us with a description of Frenchman's Ford, but we cut all conversation short by riding away to the camp. "'We'll just save them the trouble and go in and see it for ourselves,' said Officer to me as we galloped along. We had left word with Honeyman what horses we wanted to ride that afternoon, and lost little time in changing mounts. Then we all set out to pay our respects to the Mushroom Village on the Yellowstone." Most of us had money, and those of the outfit who had returned were clean-shaven and brought the report that a shave was two bits 
and a drink the same price. The town struck me as something new and novel, two-thirds of the habitations being canvas. Immense quantities of buffalo hides were drying or already baled, and waiting transportation, as we afterward learned, to navigable points on the Missouri. Large bull trains were encamped on the outskirts of the village, while many such outfits were in town, receiving cargoes or discharging freight. The drivers of these ox trains lounged in the streets and thronged the saloons and gambling resorts. The population was extremely mixed, and almost every language could be heard spoken on the streets. The men were fine types of the pioneer, buffalo hunters, freighters, and other plainsmen, though as hardly picturesque in figure and costume as a modern artist would paint them. For native coloring, there were typical specimens of northern Indians, grunting their jargon amid the babble of other tongues, and groups of squaws wandered through the irregular streets in gaudy blankets and red calico. The only civilizing element to be seen was the camp of engineers running the survey of the Northern Pacific Railroad. Tiring our horses in a group to a hitch rack in the rear of a saloon called the Buffalo Bull, we entered by a rear door and lined up at the bar for our first drink since leaving Ogallala. Games of chance were running in the rear for those who felt inclined to try their luck, while in front of the bar, against the farther wall, were a number of small tables, around which were seated the patrons of the place, playing for drinks. One couldn't help being impressed with the unrestrained freedom of the village, whose sole product seemed to be buffalo hides. Every man in the place wore the regulation six-shooter in his belt, and quite a number wore two. The primitive law of nature, known as self-preservation, was very evident in August of 82 at Frenchman's Ford. It reminded me of the early days at home in Texas, where, on a rising in the morning, one buckled on his six-shooter as though it were part of his dress. After a second round of drinks, we strolled out into the front street to look up Flood and McCann, and incidentally, get a shave. We soon located McCann, who had a hunk of dried buffalo meat, and was chipping it off and feeding it to some Indian children whose acquaintance he seemed to be cultivating. On sighting us, he gave the children the remainder of the jerked buffalo, and at once placed himself at our disposal as guide to Frenchman's Ford. He had been all over the town that morning, and knew the name of every saloon and those of several barkeepers as well. Pointed out the bullet holes in the log building, where the last shooting scrape occurred, and otherwise showed us the sights in the village which we might have overlooked. A barber shop? Well, certainly, and he led the way informing us that the wagon wheel would be filled by evening, that the mules were already shod, and that Flood had ridden down to the crossing to look at the ford. Two barbers turned us out rapidly, and as we left, we continued to take in the town, strolling by pairs and drinking moderately as we went. Flood had returned in the meantime, and seemed rather convivial, and quite willing to enjoy the enforced layover with us. While taking a drink in Yellowstone Bob's place, the foreman took occasion to call the attention of the rebel to a cheap lithograph of General Grant, which hung behind the bar. The two discussed the merits of the picture, and Priest, who was an admirer of the magnanimity as well as the military genius of Grant, spoke in reserved yet favorable terms of the general. When Flood flippantly chided him on his eulogistic remarks, over an officer to whom he had once been surrendered. The rebel took the chafing in good humor, and when our glasses were filled, Flood suggested to Priest that since she was such an admirer of Grant, possibly he wished to propose a toast to the general's health. "'You're young, Jim,' said the rebel, "'and if you've gone through what I have, your views of things might be different. My admiration for the generals on our side survived wounds, prisons, and changes of fortune, but time has tempered my views on some things, and now I don't enthuse over generals when the men of the ranks who made them famous are forgotten. Through the fortunes of war I saluted Grant when we were surrendered, but I wouldn't propose a toast or take off my hat now to any man that lives.' 
During the comments of the rebel, a stranger, who evidently overheard them, rose from one of the tables in the place and sauntered over to the end of the bar, an attentive listener to the succeeding conversation. He was a younger man than Priest, with a head of heavy black hair reaching his shoulders, while his dress was largely of buckskin, profusely ornamented with beadwork and fringes. He was armed, as was everyone else, and from his languid demeanor, as well as from his smart appearance, one would classify him, at a passing glance, as a frontier gambler. As we turned away from the bar to an unoccupied table, Priest waited for his change, when the stranger accosted him with an inquiry as to where he was from. In the conversation that ensued, the stranger, who had noticed the good-humored manner in which the rebel had taken the chiding of our foreman, pretending to take him to task for some of his remarks. But in this he made a mistake. What his friends might safely say to Priest would be treated as an insult from a stranger. Seeing that he would not stand his chiding, the other attempted to mollify him by proposing they have a drink together and part friendly, to which the rebel assented. I was pleased with the favorable turn of affairs, for my bunkie had used some rather severe language in resenting the remarks of the stranger, which now had the promise of being dropped amicably. I knew the temper of Priest, and so did Flood and Honeyman, and we were all anxious to get him away from the stranger. So I asked our foreman, as soon as they had drunk together, to go over and tell Priest we were waiting for him to make up a game of cards. The two were standing at the bar in a most friendly attitude, but as they raised their glasses to drink, the stranger, holding his at arm's length, said, "'Here's a toast for you, to General Grant, the ablest.' But the toast was never finished, for Priest dashed the contents of his glass in the stranger's face, and calmly replacing the glass on the bar, backed across the room towards us. When half across, a sudden movement on the part of the stranger caused him to halt. But it seemed the picturesque gentleman beside the bar was only searching his pockets for a handkerchief. "'Don't you get your hand on that gun you wear,' said the rebel, whose blood was up, unless you intend to use it. "'But you can't shoot a minute too quick to suit me. What do you wear a gun for, anyhow? Let's see how straight you can shoot.' As the stranger made no reply, Priest continued, "'The next time you have anything to rub in, pick your man better. The man who insults me gets all that's due him for his trouble.' Still eliciting no response, the rebel taunted him further, saying, "'Go on and finish your toast, you patriotic beauty. I'll give you another. Jeff Davis and the Southern Confederacy.' We all rose from the table, and Flood, going over to Priest, said, "'Come along, Paul.' We don't want to have any trouble here. Let's go across the street and have a game of California Jack. But the rebel stood like a chiseled statue, ignoring the friendly counsel of our foreman, while the stranger, after wiping the liquor from his face and person, walked across the room and seated himself at the table from which he had risen. A stillness of death pervaded the room, which was only broken by our foreman repeating his request to priest to come away. But the latter replied, No, when I leave this place, it will not be done in fear of anyone. When a man goes out of his way to insult me, he must take the consequences, and he can always find me if he wants satisfaction. We'll take another drink before we go. Everybody in the house, come up and take a drink with Paul Priest. The inmates of the place, to the number of possibly twenty, who had been witness to what had occurred, accepted the invitation quitting their games and gathering around the bar. Priest took a position at the end of the bar where he could notice any movement on the part of his adversary, as well as the faces of his guests, and smiling on them said in true hospitality, "'What will you have, gentlemen?' There was a forced effort on the part of the drinkers to appear indifferent to the situation, but with a stranger sitting sullenly in their rear and an iron-gray man standing at the farther end of the line, hungering for an opportunity to settle differences with six-shooters, their indifference was an empty mockery. Some of the players returned to their games, while others sauntered into the street. Yet Priest showed no disposition to go. After a while, the stranger walked over to the bar 
and called for a glass of whiskey. The rebel stood at the end of the bar, calmly rolling a cigarette, and, as the stranger seemed not to notice him, Priest attracted his attention and said, "'I'm just passing through here, and shall only be in town this afternoon. So if there's anything between us that demands settlement, don't hesitate to ask for it.' The stranger drained his glass at a single gulp, and with admirable composure replied, "'If there's anything between us, we'll settle it in due time, and as men usually settle such differences in this country. I have a friend or two in town, and as soon as I have seen them, you will receive notice, or you may consider the matter dropped. That's all I care to say at present.' He walked away to the rear of the room. Priest joined us, and we strolled out of the place. In the street, a grizzled, gray-bearded man who had drunk with him inside, approached my bunkie and said, "'You want to watch that fellow. He claims to be from Gallatin County, but he isn't, for I live there. There's a pal with him, and they've got some good horses. But I know every brand on the headwaters of the Missouri, and their horses were never bred on any of its three forks. Don't give him any the best of you. Keep an eye on him, comrade.' After this warning, the old man turned into the first open door, and we crossed over to the wheelwright shop, and as the wheel would not be finished for several hours yet, we continued our survey of the town, and our next landing was at the Buffalo Bowl. On entering, we found four of our men in a game of cards at the very first table, while Officer was reported as being in the gambling room in the rear. The only vacant table in the bar room was the last one in the far corner, and calling for a deck of cards, we occupied it. I sat with my back to the log wall of the low one-story room, while on my left, in fronting the door, Priest took a seat with Flood for his partner, while Honeyman fell to me. After playing a few hands, Flood suggested that Billy go forward and exchange seats with some of our outfit, so as to be near the door where he could see anyone that entered while from his position the rear door would be similarly guarded. Under this change, Rod Wheat came back to our table and took Honeyman's place. We had been playing along for an hour, with people passing in and out of the gambling room, and expected shortly to start for camp, when Priest's long-haired adversary came in at the front door and, walking through the room, passed into the gambling department. John Officer, after winning a few dollars in the card room, was standing alongside watching our game, and as the stranger passed by, Priest gave him the wink, on which Officer followed the stranger and a heavy-set companion who was with him into the rear room. We had played only a few hands when the heavy-set man came back to the bar, took a drink, and walked over to watch a game of cards at the second table from the front door. Officer came back shortly afterwards and whispered to us that there were four of them to look out for, as he had seen them conferring together. Priest seemed the least concerned of any of us, but I noticed he eased the holster on his belt forward, where it would be ready to his hand. We had called for a round of drinks, Officer taking one with us, when two men came out of the gambling hall and, halting at the bar, pretended to divide some money which they wished to have it appear that they had won in the card room. Their conversation was loud and intended to attract attention, but Officer gave us the wink, and their ruse was perfectly understood. After taking a drink and attracting as much attention as possible over the division of the money, they separated but remained in the room. I was dealing the cards a few minutes later when the long-haired man emerged from the gambling hall and, imitating the maudlin, sauntered up to the bar and asked for a drink. After being served, he walked about halfway to the door, then, whirling suddenly, stepped to the end of the bar, placed his hands upon it, sprang up and stood upright on it. He whipped out two six-shooters, let loose a yell which caused a commotion throughout the room, and walked very deliberately the length of the counter, his attention centered upon the occupants of our table. Not attracting the notice he expected in our quarter, he turned and slowly repaced the bar, hurling anathemas on Texas and Texans in general. I saw the rebel's eyes, steeled to intensity, meet floods across the table, and in that glance of our foreman he evidently read approval, for he rose rigidly 
with the stealth of a tiger, and for the first time that day his hand went to the handle of his six-shooter. One of the two pretended winners at cards saw the movement in our quarter and sang out a warning, Sidaldo, mucho! The man on the bar whirled on the word of warning and blazed away with his two guns into our corner. I had risen at the word and was pinned against the wall, where on the first fire a rain of dirt fell from the chinking in the wall over my head. As soon as the others sprang away from the table, I kicked it over in clearing myself and came to my feet just as the rebel fired his second shot. I had the satisfaction of seeing his long-haired adversary reel backwards, firing his guns into the ceiling as he went, and, in falling, crash heavily into the glassware on the back bar. The smoke which filled the room left nothing visible for a few moments. Meantime, Priest, satisfied that his aim had gone true, turned, passed through the rear room, gained his horse, and was galloping away to the herd before any semblance of order was restored. As the smoke cleared away and we passed forward through the room, John Officer had one of the three partners standing with his hands to the wall, while a six-shooter lay on the floor under Officer's foot. He had made but one shot into our corner when the muzzle of a gun was pushed against his ear with an imperative order to drop his arms, which he had promptly done. The two others, who had been under the surveillance of our men at the forward table, never made a move or offered to bring a gun into action, and after the killing of their picturesque partner, passed together out of the house. There had been five or six shots fired into our corner, but the first double shot, fired when three of us were still sitting, went too high for effect, while the remainder were scattering. Though Rod Wheat got a bullet through his coat, close enough to burn the skin on his shoulder. The dead man was laid out on the floor of the saloon, and through curiosity, for it could hardly have been much of a novelty to the inhabitants of Frenchman's Ford, hundreds came to gaze on the corpse and examine the wounds, one above the other through his vitals, either of which would have been fatal. Officer's prisoner admitted that the dead man was his partner and offered to remove the corpse if released. On turning his six-shooter over to the proprietor of the place, he was given his freedom to depart and look up his friends. As it was after sundown, and our wheel was refilled and ready, we set out for camp, where we found Priest had taken a fresh horse and started back over the trail. No one felt any uneasiness over his absence, for he had demonstrated his ability to protect himself, and truth compels me to say that the outfit to a man was proud of him. Honeyman was substituted on our guard in the rebel's place, sleeping with me that night, and after we were in bed, Billy said, in his enthusiasm, If that horse thief had not relied on pot shooting, and had been modest and only used one gun, he might have hurt some of you fellows. But when I saw old Paul rising his gun to a level as he shot, I knew he was cool and steady, and I'd rather died right there than to see him fail to get his man. End of chapter 21「would present no difficulties in fording, and our foreman was anxious to make a long drive that day so as to make up for our enforced layover. We had breakfast by the time the horses were corralled, and when we overtook the grazing herd, the cattle were within a mile of the river. Flood had looked over the ford the day before and took one point of the herd as we went down into the crossing. The water was quite chilly to the cattle, though the horses in the lead paid little attention to it, the water in no place being over three feet deep. A number of spectators had come up from Frenchman's to watch the herd ford, 
the crossing being about a half a mile above the village. No one made any inquiry for Priest, though ample opportunity was given them to see that the gray-haired man was missing. After the herd had crossed, a number of us lent a rope in assisting the wagon over, and when we reached the farther bank, we waved our hats to the group on the south side in farewell to them and to Frenchman's Ford. The trail on leaving the river led up many berries, one of the tributaries of the Yellowstone, putting in from the north side, and we paralleled it mile after mile. It was with difficulty that riders could be kept on the right-hand side of the herd, for along it grew endless quantities of a species of upland huckleberry, and, breaking off branches, we feasted as we rode along. The grade up this creek was quite pronounced, for before night the channel of the creek had narrowed to several yards in width. On the second day out, the wild fruit disappeared early in the morning, and after a continued gradual climb, we made camp that night on the summit of the divide, within plain sight of the Muscle Shell River. From this divide there was a splendid view of the surrounding country, as far as the eye could see. To our right, as we neared the summit, we could see in that rarefied atmosphere the buttes, like sentinels on duty, as they dotted the immense tableland between the Yellowstone and the mother Missouri, while on our left lay a thousand hills, untenanted, save by the deer, elk, and a remnant of buffalo. Another half-day's drive brought us to the shoals on the mussel shell, about twelve miles above the entrance of Flat Willow Creek. It was one of the easiest crossings we had encountered in many a day, considering the size of the river and the flow of water. Long before the advent of the white men, these shoals had been used for generations by immense herds of buffalo and elk, migrating back and forth between their summer ranges and winter pasturage, as the converging game trails on either side indicated. It was also an old Indian ford. After crossing and resuming our afternoon drive, the cattle trail ran within a mile of the river, and had it not been for the herd of northern wintered cattle, and possibly others, which had passed along a month or more in advance of us, it would have been hard to determine which were cattle and which were game trails, the country being literally cut up with these pathways. When within a few miles of the flat willow, the trail bore off to the northwest, and we camped that night some distance below the junction of the former creek with the big box elder. Before our watch had been on guard twenty minutes that night, we heard someone whistling in the distance, and as whoever it was refused to come any nearer the herd, a thought struck me, and I rode out into the darkness and hailed him. "'Is that you, Tom?' came the question to my challenge, and the next minute I was wringing the hand of my old bunkie, the rebel. I assured him that the coast was clear, and that no inquiry had been made for him the following morning." when crossing the Yellowstone, by any of the inhabitants of Frenchman's Ford. He returned with me to the bedground, and meeting Honeyman as he circled around, was almost unhorsed by the latter's warmth of reception, and officer's delight on meeting my bunkie was none the less demonstrative. For nearly a half an hour he rode around with one or the other of us, and as we knew he had had little sleep, if any, for the last three nights, all of us begged him to go on into camp and go to sleep. But the old rascal loafed around with us on guard, seemingly delighted with our company and reluctant to leave. Finally, Honeyman and I prevailed on him to go to the wagon. But before leaving us, he said, Why, I've been in sight of the herd for the last day and night. But I'm getting a little tired of lying out with these dry cattle these cool nights and living on huckleberries and grouse so I thought I'd just ride in and get a fresh horse and a square meal once more. But if Flood says stay, you'll see me at my old place on the point tomorrow. Had the owner of the herd suddenly appeared in camp, he could not have received such an ovation as was extended priest the next morning when his presence became known. From the cook to the foreman, they gathered around our bed, where the rebel sat up in the blankets and held an informal reception and two hours afterwards he was riding on the right point of the herd, as if nothing had happened. 
We had a fair trail up Big Box Elder, and for the following few days, or until the source of that creek was reached, met nothing to check our course. Our foreman had been riding in advance of the herd, and after returning to us at noon one day, reported that the trail turned a due northward course towards the Missouri, and all herds had seemingly taken it. As we had to touch at Fort Benton, which was almost due westward, he had concluded to quit the trail and try to intercept the military road running from Fort McGinnis to Benton. McGinnis lay to the south of us, and our foreman hoped to strike the military road at an angle on as near a westward course as possible. Accordingly, after dinner, he set out to look out the country and took me with him. We bore off towards the Missouri, and within a half hour's ride after leaving the trail, we saw some loose horses about three miles distance, down in a little valley through which flowed a creek towards the mussel shell. We reined in and watched the horses several minutes, when we both agreed from their movements that they were hobbled. We scouted out some five or six miles, finding the country somewhat rough, but passable for a herd and wagon. Flood was anxious to investigate those hobbled horses, for it bespoke the camp of someone in the immediate vicinity. On our return, the horses were still in view, and with no little difficulty, we descended from the mesa into the valley and reached them. To our agreeable surprise, one of them was wearing a bell, while nearly half of them were hobbled, there being twelve head, the greater portion of which looked like pack horses. Supposing the camp, if there was one, must be up in the hills, we followed a bridle path up a stream in search of it, and soon came upon four men placer mining on the banks of the creek. When we made our errand known, one of these placer miners, an elderly man, who seemed familiar with the country, expressed some doubts about our leaving the trail, though he said there was a bridle path with which he was acquainted across to the military road. Flood at once offered to pay him well if he would pilot us across to the road, or near enough so that we could find our way. The old placerman hesitated, and after consulting among his partners, asked how we were fixed for provisions, explaining that they wished to remain a month or so longer, and that game had been scared away from the immediate vicinity until it had become hard to secure meat. But he found Flood ready in that quarter, for he immediately offered to kill a beef and load down any two pack horses they had if he would consent to pilot us over to within striking distance of the Fort Benton Road. The offer was immediately accepted, and I was dispatched to drive in their horses. Two of the placer miners accompanied us back to the trail, both riding good saddle horses and leading two others under pack saddles. We overtook the herd within a mile of the point where the trail was to be abandoned, and after sending the wagon ahead, our foreman asked our guests to pick out any cow or steer in the herd. When they declined, he cut out a fat stray cow which had come into the herd down on the North Platte, had her driven in after the wagon, killed and quartered. When we had laid the quarters on convenient rocks to cool and harden during the night, our future pilot timidly inquired what we proposed to do with the hide, and on being informed that he was welcome to it, seemed delighted, remarking as I helped him to stake it out where it would dry, that raw hide was mighty handy repairing pack saddles. Our visitors interested us, for it is probable that not a man in our outfit had ever seen a miner before, though we had read of the life and were deeply interested in everything they did or said. They were very plain men and of simple manners, but we had great difficulty in getting them to talk. After supper, while idling away a couple of hours around our campfire, the outfit told stories in the hope that our guests would become reminiscent and give us some insight into their experiences. Bob Blades leading off. I was in a cow town once, up on the head of the Chisholm Trail, at a time when a church fair was being pulled off. There were lots of old longhorn cowmen living in the town who owned cattle in that Cherokee strip that officer is always talking about. Well, there's lots of folks up there that think a nigger is as good as anybody else. And when you find such people set in their ways, it's best not to argue matters with them, 
but lay low and let on you think that way too. That's the way those old Texas cowmen acted about it. Well, at this church fair, there was to be voted a prize of a nice baby wagon, which had been donated by some merchant, to the prettiest baby under a year old. Colonel Bob Zellers was in town at the time, stopping at a hotel, where the darky cook was a man who had once worked for him on the trail. Frog, the darky, had married when he quit the colonel's service, and at the time of this fair there was a piccaninny in his family, about a year old, and nearly the color of a new saddle. A few of these old cowmen got funny, and thought it would be a good joke to have Frog enter his baby at the fair, and Colonel Bob, being the leader in the movement, had no trouble convincing the darky that the baby wagon was his if he would only enter his youngster. Frog thought the world of the old colonel, and the latter assured him that he would vote for his baby while he had a dollar or a cow left. The result was, Frog gave his enthusiastic consent, and the colonel agreed to enter the piccaninny in the contest. Well, the colonel attended to the entering of the baby's name, and then on the dead quiet went around and rustled up every cowman and puncher in town, and had them promise to be on hand to vote for the prettiest baby at ten cents a throw. The fair was being held in the largest hall in town, and at the appointed hour we were all on hand, as well as Frog and his wife and baby. There were about a dozen entries, and only one blackbird in the covey. The list of contestants was read by the minister, and as each name was announced, there was a vigorous clapping of hands all over the house by friends of each baby. But when the name of Miss Priscilla June Jones was announced, the Texas contingent made their presence known by such a deafening outburst of applause that old Frog grinned from ear to ear. He saw himself right then pushing that baby wagon. Well, on the first heat we voted sparingly, and as the vote was read out about every quarter hour, Priscilla June Jones, on the first turn, was fourth in the race. On the second report, our favorite had moved up to third place, after which the weaker ones were deserted, and all the voting blood was centered on the two white leaders, with our blackbird a close third. We were behaving ourselves nicely, and our money was welcome if we weren't. When the third vote was announced, Frog's Piccaninny was second in the race, with her nose lapped on the flank of the leader. Then those who thought a darky was as good as anyone else got on the prod in a mild form, and you could hear them voicing their opinions all over the hall. We heard it all, but sat as nice as pie, and never said a word. When the final vote was called for, we knew it was the home stretch, and every rascal of us got his weasel skin out and sweetened the voting on Miss Priscilla June Jones. Some of those old longhorns didn't think any more of a twenty-dollar gold piece than I do of a white chip, especially when there was a chance to give those good people a dose of their own medicine. I don't know how many votes we cast on the last whirl, but we swamped all opposition, and our favorite cantered under the wire an easy winner. Then you should have heard the kicking, but we kept still and inwardly chuckled. The minister announced the winner, and some of those good people didn't have any better manners than to hiss and cut up ugly. We stayed until Frog got the new baby wagon in his clutches, when we dropped out casually and met at the ranch saloon, where Colonel Zellers had taken possession behind the bar and was dispensing hospitality in proper celebration of his victory. Much to our disappointment, our guests remained silent and showed no disposition to talk except to answer civil questions which Flood asked regarding the trail crossing on the Missouri and what the river was like in the vicinity of old Fort Benton. When the questions had been answered, they again relapsed into silence. The fire was replenished, and after the conversation had touched on several subjects, Joe Stallings took his turn with a yarn. When my folks first came to Texas, said Joe, they settled in Ellis County near Waxahachie. My father was one of the pioneers in that county, at a time when his nearest neighbor lived ten miles from his front gate. But after the war, the country had settled up. These old pioneers naturally hung together and visited and chummed with one another in preference to the new settlers. 
One spring, when I was about fifteen years old, one of those old pioneer neighbors of ours died, and my father decided that he would go to the funeral or bust a hamstring. If any of you know anything about that black, waxy, hog-wallow land in Ellis County, you know that when it gets muddy in the spring, a wagon wheel will fill solid with waxy mud. So at the time of this funeral, it was impossible to go on the road with any kind of a vehicle, and my father had to go on horseback. He was an old man at the time and didn't like the idea, but it was either go on horseback or stay home, and go he would. They raised good horses in Ellis County, and my father had raised some of the best of them, brought the stock from Tennessee. He liked good blood in a horse, and was always opposed to racing, but he raised some boys who weren't. I had a number of brothers older than myself, and they took a special pride in trying every colt we raised to see what he amounted to in speed. Of course, this had to be done away from home. But that was easy, for these older brothers thought nothing of riding twenty miles to a tournament, barbecue, or roundup, and when away from home they always tried their horses with the best in the country. At the time of this funeral we had a crackerjack five-year-old chestnut sorrel gelding that could show his heels to any horse in that country. He was a peach. You could turn him on a saddle blanket and jump him fifteen feet, and that cow never lived that he couldn't cut. So on the day of the funeral, my father was in a quandary as to which horse to ride, but when he appealed to his boys, they recommended the best on the ranch, which was the chestnut gelding. My old man had some doubts as to his ability to ride the horse, for he hadn't been on a horse's back for years, but my brothers assured him that the chestnut was as obedient as a kitten, and that before he had been on the road an hour, the mud would take all the frisk and frolic out of him. There was nearly fifteen miles to go, and they assured him that he would never get there if he rode any other horse. Well, at last he consented to ride the gelding, and the horse was made ready, properly groomed, his tail tied up, and saddled and led up to the block. It took every member of the family to get my father rigged to start, but at last he announced himself ready. Two of my brothers held the horse until he found the off stirrup, and then they turned him loose. The chestnut danced off a few rods and settled down into a steady clip that was good for five or six miles an hour. My father reached the house in good time for the funeral service, but when the procession started for the burial ground, the horse was somewhat restless and impatient from the cold. There was quite a string of wagons and other vehicles from the immediate neighborhood which had braved the mud, and the line was nearly half a mile in length between the house and the graveyard. There were also possibly a hundred men on horseback bringing up the rear of the procession, and the chestnut, not understanding the solemnity of the occasion, was right on his mettle. Surrounded as he was by other horses, he kept his weather eye open for a race, for in coming home from dances and picnics with my brothers he had often been tried in short dashes of a half a mile or so. In order to get him out of the crowd of horses, my father dropped back with another pioneer to the extreme rear of the funeral line. When the procession was nearing the cemetery, a number of horsemen, who were late, galloped up in the rear. The chestnut, supposing a race was on, took the bit in his teeth and tore down past the procession as though it was a free-for-all Texas sweepstakes. The old man's white beard whipping the breeze in his endeavor to hold in the horse nor did he check him until the head of the procession had been passed. When my father returned home that night, there was a family roundup, for he was smoking under the collar. Of course my brothers denied having ever run the horse, and my mother took their part. But the old gent knew a thing or two about horses, and shortly afterwards he got even with his boys by selling the chestnut, which broke their hearts properly. The elder of the two placer miners, a long-whiskered, pock-marked man, arose, and after walking out from the fire some distance, returned and called our attention to signs in the sky, which he assured us were a sure indication of a change in the weather. But we were more anxious that he should talk about something else, for we were in the habit of taking the weather just as it came. When neither one showed any disposition to talk, 
Flood said to them, "'It's bedtime with us, and one of you can sleep with me, while I've fixed up an extra bed for the other. I generally get out about daybreak, but if that's too early for you, don't let my getting up disturb you. And you fourth guard men, let the cattle off the bed ground on a due westerly course and point them up the divide. Now get to bed, everybody, for we want to make a big drive tomorrow. End of chapter 22「Chapter Twenty Three of the Log of a Cowboy by Andy Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Delivery. I shall never forget the next morning, August twenty sixth, eighteen eighty two. As we of the third guard were relieved, about two hours before dawn, the wind veered around to the northwest, and a mist which had been falling during the forepart of our watch changed to soft flakes of snow. As soon as we were relieved, we scurried back to our blankets, drew the tarpaulin over our heads, and slept until dawn, when, on being awakened by the foreman, we found a wet, slushy snow some two inches in depth on the ground. Several of the boys in the outfit declared it was the first snowfall they had ever seen, and I had but a slight recollection of having witnessed one in early boyhood in our old Georgia home. We gathered around the fire like a lot of frozen children, and our only solace was that our drive was nearing an end. The two placermen paid little heed to the raw morning, and our pilot assured us that this was but the squaw winter which always preceded the Indian summer. We made our customary early start, and while saddling up that morning, Flood and the two placer miners packed the beef on their two pack horses, first cutting off enough to last us several days. The cattle, when we overtook them, presented a sorry spectacle, apparently being as cold as we were, although we had our last stitch of clothing on, including our slickers belted with a horse hobble. But when Flood and our guide rode past the herd, I noticed our pilot's coat was not even buttoned, nor was the thin cotton shirt which he wore. But his chest was exposed to that raw morning air which chilled the very marrow in our bones. Our foreman and guide kept in sight in the lead, the herd traveling briskly up the long mountain divide, and about the middle of the forenoon the sun came out warm and the snow began to melt. Within an hour after starting that morning, Quince Forrest, who was riding in front of me in the swing, dismounted and picking out of the snow a brave little flower, which looked something like a pansy, dropped back to me and said, "'My weather gauge says it's eighty-eight degrees below freezing. But I want you to smell this posy, Quirk, and tell me, on the dead thieving, do you ever expect to see your sunny southern home again? And did you notice the pock-marked colonel bearing his brisket to the morning breeze?' Two hours after the sun came out, the snow had disappeared, and the cattle fell to and grazed until long after the noon hour. Our pilot led us up the divide between the Missouri and the headwaters of the Muscle Shell during the afternoon, weaving in and out around the heads of creeks, putting into either river, and towards evening we crossed quite a creek running towards the Missouri, where we secured ample water for the herd. We made a late camp that night, and our guide assured us that another half-day's drive would put us on the Judith River, where we would intercept the Fort Benton Road. The following morning our guide led us for several hours up a gradual ascent to the plateau, till we reached the tableland, when he left us to return to his own camp. Flood again took the lead, and within a mile we turned on our regular course, which by early noon had descended into the valley of the Judith River, and entered the Fort McGinnis and Benton Military Road. Our route was now clearly defined, and about noon on the last day of the month we sighted, beyond the Missouri River, the flag floating over Fort Benton. We made a crossing that afternoon below the fort, and Flood went into the post, expecting either to meet Lovell 
or to receive our final instructions regarding the delivery. After crossing the Missouri, we grazed the herd over to the Teton River, a stream which paralleled the former water course, the military post being located between the two. We had encamped for the night when Flood returned with word of a letter he had received from our employer and an interview he had had with the commanding officer of Fort Benton, who, it seemed, was to have a hand in the delivery of the herd. Lovell had been detained in the final settlement of my brother Bob's herd at the Crow Agency by some differences regarding weights. Under our present instructions, we were to proceed slowly to the Blackfoot Agency, and immediately on the arrival of Lovell at Benton, he and the Commandant would follow by ambulance and overtake us. The distance from Fort Benton to the Agency was variously reported to be from 120 to 130 miles, six or seven days' travel for the herd at the farthest, and then goodbye, Circle Dots. A number of officers and troopers from the post overtook us the next morning and spent several hours with us as the herd trailed out up the Teton. They were riding fine horses, which made our through-saddle stock look insignificant in comparison though had they covered 2,400 miles and lived on grass as had our mounts, some of the luster of their glossy coats would have been absent. They looked well, but it would have been impossible to use them or any domestic bred horse in trail work like ours, unless a supply of grain could be carried with us. The range country produced a horse suitable to range needs, hardy and a good forager, which, when not overworked under the saddle, met every requirement of his calling, as well as being self-sustaining. Our horses, in fact, were in better flesh when we crossed the Missouri than they were the day we received the herd on the Rio Grande. The spectators from the fort quitted us near the middle of the forenoon, and we snailed on westward at our leisurely gait. There was a fair road up the Teton, which we followed for several days without incident, to the fork of that river, where we turned up Muddy Creek, the north fork of the Teton. That noon, while catching saddle horses, dinner not being quite ready, we noticed a flurry amongst the cattle, then almost a mile in our rear. Two men were on herd with them as usual, grazing them forward up the creek and watering as they came, when suddenly the cattle in the lead came tearing out of the creek, and on reaching open ground, turned at bay. After several bunches had seemingly taken fright at the same object, we noticed Bull Durham, who was on herd, ride through the cattle to the scene of disturbance. We saw him, on nearing the spot, lie down on the neck of his horse, watch intently for several minutes, then quietly drop back to the rear, circle the herd, and ride for the wagon. We had been observing the proceeding closely, though from a distance for some time. Daylight was evidently all that saved us from a stampede, and as Bull Durham galloped up, he was almost breathless. He informed us that an old cinnamon bear and two cubs were burying along the creek and had taken the right of way. Then there was a hustling and borrowing of cartridges, while saddles were cinched onto horses, as though human life depended on alacrity. We were all feeling quite gala, anyhow, and this looked like a chance for some sport. It was hard to hold the impulsive ones in check until the others were ready. The cattle pointed us to the location of the quarry as we rode forward. When within a quarter of a mile, we separated into two squads in order to gain the rear of the bears, cut them off from the creek, and force them into the open. The cattle held the attention of the bears until we had gained their rear, and as we came up between them and the creek, the old one reared up on her haunches and took a most astonished and innocent look at us. A single woof brought one of the cubs to her side, and she dropped on all fours and lumbered off, a half a dozen shots hastening her pace in an effort to circle the horsemen who were gradually closing in. In making this circle to gain the protection of some thickets which skirted the creek, she was compelled to cross quite an open space, and before she had covered the distance of fifty yards, a rain of ropes came down on her, and she was thrown backward with no less than four lariats fastened over her neck and foreparts. parts. 
Then ensued a lively scene, for the horses snorted, and in spite of Rowles refused to face the bear. But our ropes, securely snubbed to pommels, held them to the quarry. Two minor circuses were meantime in progress with the two cubs, but pressure of duty held those of us who had fastened on to the old cinnamon. The ropes were taut, and several of them were about her throat. The horses were pulling in as many different directions, yet the strain of all the lariats failed to choke her as we expected. At this juncture, four of the loose men came to our rescue and proposed shooting the brute. We were willing enough, for though we had better than a tail hold, we were very ready to let go. But while there were plenty of good shots among us, our horses had now become wary and could not, when free from ropes, be induced to approach within twenty yards of the bear, and they were so fidgety that accurate aim was impossible. We, who had ropes on the old bear, begged the boys to get down and take it afoot, but they were not disposed to listen to our reason, and blazed away from rearing horses, not one shot in ten taking effect. There was no telling how long this random shooting would have lasted, but one shot cut my rope two feet from the noose, and, with one rope less on her, the old bear made some ugly surges, and had not Joe Stallings had a wheeler of a horse on the rope, she would have done somebody damage. The rebel was on the opposite side from Stallings and myself, and as soon as I was freed, he called me around to him, and shifting his rope to me, borrowed my six-shooter, and joined those who were shooting. Dismounting, he gave the reins of his horse to Flood, and walked up to within fifteen steps of the mother Bruin, and, kneeling, emptied both six-shooters with telling accuracy. The old bear winced at nearly every shot, and once she made an ugly surge on the ropes, but the three guy lines held her up to Priest's deliberate aim. The vitality of that cinnamon almost staggers belief, for after both six-shooters had been emptied into her body, she floundered on the ropes with all her former strength, although blood was dripping and gushing from her numerous wounds. Borrowing a third gun, Priest returned to the fight, and as we slacked the ropes slightly, the old bear reared, facing her antagonist. The rebel emptied his third gun into her before she sank, choked, bleeding, and exhausted, to the ground, and even then no one dared to approach her, for she struck out wildly with all fours as she slowly succumbed to the inevitable. One of the cubs had been roped, and afterwards shot at close quarters, while the other had reached the creek and climbed a sapling which grew on the bank, when a few shots brought him to the ground. The two cubs were about the size of a small black bear, though the mother was a large specimen of her species. The cubs had nice coats of soft fur, and their hides were taken as trophies of the fight, but the robe of the mother was a summer one and worthless. While we were skinning the cubs, the foreman called our attention to the fact that the herd had drifted up the creek nearly opposite the wagon. During the encounter with the bears, he was the most excited one in the outfit, and was the man who cut my rope with his random shooting from horseback. But now the herd recovered his attention, and he dispatched some of us to ride around the cattle. When we met at the wagon for dinner, the excitement was still on us, and the hunt was unanimously voted the most exciting bit of sport and powder-burning we had experienced on our trip. Late that afternoon, a forage wagon from Fort Benton passed us with four loose ambulance mules in charge of five troopers, who were going on ahead to establish a relay station in anticipation of the trip of the post-commandant to the Blackfoot Agency. There were to be two relay stations between the post and the agency, and this detachment expected to go into camp that night within forty miles of our destination, there to await the arrival of the commanding officer and the owner of the herd at Benton. These soldiers were out two days from the post when they passed us, and they assured us that the ambulance would go through from Benton to Blackfoot without a halt except for the changing of relay teams. The next forenoon we passed the last relay camp, well up the muddy, and shortly afterwards the road left the creek, turning north by a little west, and we entered on the last tack of our long drive. On the evening of the 6th of September, as we were going into camp 
on Two Medicine Creek, within ten miles of the agency, the ambulance overtook us, under escort of the troopers whom we had passed at the last relay station. We had not seen Don Lovell since June, when we passed Dodge, and it goes without saying that we were glad to meet him again. On the arrival of the party, the cattle had not yet been bedded, so Lovell borrowed a horse and with flood took a look over the herd before darkness set in, having previously prevailed on the commanding officer to rest an hour and have supper before proceeding to the agency. When they returned from inspecting the cattle, the commandant and Lovell agreed to make the final delivery on the 8th, if it were agreeable to the agent, and with this understanding continued their journey. The next morning Flood rode into the agency, borrowing McCann's saddle and taking an extra horse with him, having left us instructions to graze the herd all day and have them in good shape with grass and water, in case they were inspected that evening on their condition. Near the middle of the afternoon, quite a cavalcade rode out from the agency, including part of a company of cavalry temporarily encamped there. The Indian agent and the commanding officer from Benton were the authorized representatives of the government, it seemed, as Lovell took extra pains in showing them over the herd, frequently consulting the contract which he held regarding sex, age, and flesh of the cattle. The only hitch in the inspection was over a number of sore-footed cattle, which was unavoidable after such a long journey. But the condition of these tender-footed animals being otherwise satisfactory, Lovell urged the agent and commandant to call up the men for explanations. The agent was no doubt a very nice man, and there may have been other things that he understood better than cattle, for he did ask a great many simple, innocent questions. Our replies, however, might have been condensed into a few simple statements. We had, we related, been over five months on the trail. After the first month, tender-footed cattle began to appear from time to time in the herd, as stony or gravelly portions of the trail were encountered. The number so affected at any one time, varying from ten to forty head. Frequently, well-known lead cattle became tender in their feet and would drop back to the rear, and on striking soft or sandy footing, recover and resume their position in the lead. That's since starting, it was safe to say, fully ten percent of the entire herd had been so affected, yet we had not lost a single head from this cause. That the general health of the animals was never affected, and that during enforced layovers, nearly all so affected recovered. As there were not over twenty-five sore-footed animals in the herd on our arrival, our explanation was sufficient, and the herd was accepted. There yet remained the counting and classification, but as this would require time, it went over until the following day. The cows had been contracted for by the head, while the steers went on their estimated weight in dressed beef. The contract calling for a million pounds, with a ten percent leeway over that amount. I was amongst the first to be interviewed by the Indian agent, and on being excused, I made the acquaintance of one of two priests who were with the party. He was a rosy-cheeked, well-fed old padre, who informed me that he had been stationed among the Blackfeet for over twenty years, and that he had labored long with the government to assist these Indians. The cows in our herd, which were to be distributed amongst the Indian families for domestic purposes, were there at his earnest solicitation. I asked him if these cows would not perish during the long winter. My recollection was still vivid of the touch of the squall winter we had experienced some two weeks previous. But he assured me that the winters were dry, if cold, and his people had made some progress in the ways of civilization, and had provided shelter and forage against the wintry weather. He informed me that previous to his labors amongst the Blackfeet, their ponies wintered without loss on the native grasses though he had since taught them to make hay, and, in anticipation of receiving these cows, such families as were entitled to share in the division had amply provided for the animal's sustenance. Lovell returned with the party to the agency, and we were to bring up the herd for classification early in the morning. Flood informed us that a beef pasture had been built that summer for the steers, while the cows would be held under herd by the military pending their distribution. 
We spent our last night with the herd singing songs until the first guard called the relief, when, realizing the lateness of the hour, we burrowed into our blankets. "'I don't know how you fellows feel about it,' said Quince Forrest, when the first guard was relieved and they had returned to camp, "'but I bade those cows good-bye on their beds tonight without a regret or a tear. The novelty of night herding loses its charm with me when it's drawn out over five months. I might be fool enough to make another such trip, but I'd rather be the Indian and let the other fellow drive the cows to me. There's a heap more comfort in it. The next morning, before we reached the agency, a number of gaudily bedecked bucks and squaws rode out to meet us. The arrival of the herd had been expected for several weeks, and our approach was a delight to the Indians, who were flocking to the agency from the nearest villages. Physically, they were fine specimens of the aborigines, but our Spanish, which Quarternight and I tried on them, was as unintelligible to them as their guttural gibberish was to us. Lovell and the agent, with a detachment of the cavalry, met us about a mile from the agency buildings, and we were ordered to cut out the cows. The herd had been grazed to contentment, and were accordingly rounded in, and the task begun at once. Our entire outfit were turned into the herd to do the work, while an abundance of troopers held the herd and looked after the cut. It took about an hour and a half, during which time we worked like Trojans. Cavalrymen several times attempted to assist us, but their horses were no match for ours in the work. A cow can turn on much less space than a cavalry horse, and except for the amusement they afforded, the military were of very little effect. After we had retrimmed the cut, the beeves were started for their pasture, and nothing now remained but the counting to complete the receiving. Four of us remained behind with the cows, but for over two hours the steers were in plain sight, while the two parties were endeavoring to make a count. How many times they recounted them before agreeing on the numbers, I do not know, for the four of us left with the cows became occupied by a controversy over the sex of a young Indian, a Blackfoot, riding a cream-colored pony. The controversy originated between Fox Quarternight and Bob Blades, who had discovered this swell among a band who had just ridden in from the West, and John Officer and myself were appealed to for our opinion. The Indian was pointed out to us across the herd, easily distinguished by beads and beaver fur trimmings in the hair, so we rode around to pass our judgment as experts on the beauty. The young Indian was not over sixteen years of age, with remarkable features, from which every trace of the aborigine seemed to be eliminated. Officer and myself were in a quandary, for we felt perfectly competent when appealed to for opinions on such a delicate subject, and we made every endeavor to open a conversation by signs and speech. But the young Blackfoot paid no attention to us, being intent upon watching the cows. The neatly moccasined feet and the shapely hand, however, indicated the feminine, and when Blades and Quarternight rode up, we rendered our decision accordingly. Blades took exception to the decision, and rode alongside the young Indian, pretending to admire the long plates of hair, toyed with the beads, pinched and patted the young Blackfoot, and finally, although the rest of us, for fear the Indian might take offense and raise trouble, pleaded with him to desist, he called the youth his squaw, when the young blood, evidently understanding the appellation, relaxed into a broad smile, and in fair English said, Me Buck. Blades burst into a loud laugh at his success, at which the Indian smiled, but accepted a cigarette, and the two cronied together while we rode away to look after our cows. The outfit returned shortly afterwards, when the rebel rode up to me and expressed himself rather profanely, at the inability of the government's representatives to count cattle in the Texas fashion. On the arrival of the agent and others, the cows were brought around, and these being much more gentle, and being under Lovell's instruction, fed between the counters in the narrowest file possible. A satisfactory count was agreed upon at the first trial. The troopers took charge of the cows after counting, and, our work over, we galloped away to the wagon, hilarious and carefree.
McCann had camped on the nearest water to the agency, and after dinner we caught out the top horses and, dressed in our best, rode into the agency proper. There was quite a group of houses for the attaches, one large general warehouse and several school and chapel buildings. I again met the old padre, who showed us over the place. One could not help being favorably impressed with the general neatness and cleanliness of the place. In answer to our questions, the priest informed us that he had mastered the Indian language early in his work, and had adopted it in his ministry, the better to effect the object of his mission. There was something touching in the zeal of this devoted padre in his work amongst the tribe, and the recognition of the government had come as a fitting climax to his work and devotion. As we rode away from the agencies, the cows being in sight under herd of a dozen soldiers, several of us rode out to them and learned that they intended to corral the cows at night and within a week distribute them to Indian families when the troops expected to return to Fort Benton. Lovell and Flood appeared at the camp about dusk, Lovell in high spirits. This, he said, was the easiest delivery of the three herds which he had driven that year. He was justified in feeling well over the year's drive, for he had in his possession a voucher for a circle dots which would crowd six figures closely. It was a gay night with us, for man and horse were free, and as we made down our beds, old man Don insisted that Flood and he should make theirs down alongside ours. He and the rebel had been joking each other during the evening, and as we went to bed were taking an occasional fling at one another as the opportunity offered. "'It's a strange thing to me,' said Lovell, as he was pulling off his boots, "'that this herd counted out a hundred and twelve head more than we started with, "'while Bob Quirk's head was only eighty-one long at the final count.' "'Well, you see,' replied the rebel, "'Quirk's was a steer herd, while ours had over a thousand cows in it, "'and you must make allowances for some of them to calve on the way. "'That ought to be easy figuring for a foxy, long-headed yank like you.' End of chapter 23「ニトリ」「ニトリ」「ニトリ」「ニトリ」「ニトリ」「ニトリ」「ニトリ」「ニトリ」「ニトリ」「ニトリ」「ニトリ」「ニトリ」「ニトリ」「ニトリ」「ニトリ」「ニトリ」「ニトリ」「ニトリ」「ニトリ」「ニトリ」「ニトリ」「ニトリ」「ニトリ」「ニトリ」「ニトリ」「ニトリ」「ニトリ」「ニトリ」「ニトリ」「ニトリ」「ニトリ」「ニトリ」「ニトリ」「ニトリ」「ニトリ」「ニトリ」「ニトリ」「ニトリ」「ニトリ」「ニ Our camp was astir with the dawn in preparation for departure on our last ride together, as we expected to make not less than forty miles a day on the way to the railroad, and our wagon was lightened to the least possible weight. The chuck box, water kegs, and such superfluities were dropped, and the supplies reduced to one week's allowance, while beds were overhauled and extra wearing apparel of the outfit was discarded. Who cared if we did sleep cold and hadn't a change to our backs? We were going home and would have money in our pockets. The first thing I do when we strike that town of Silver Bow, said Bull Durham, as he was putting on his last shirt, is to discard to the skin and get me new togs to a finish. I'll commence on my little pattering feet, which will require fifteen dollar moccasins. And then about a six dollar checked cottonade suit, and top off with a seven dollar brown Stetson. Then, with a few drinks under my belt and a rim fire cigar in my mouth, I'd admire to meet the governor of Montana, if convenient. Before the sun was an hour high, we bade farewell to the Blackfoot Agency and were doubling back over the trail with Lovell in our company. Our first night's camp was on the muddy. And the second on the Sun River. We were sweeping across the tablelands adjoining the main divide of the Rocky Mountains, like the Chinook winds which sweep that majestic range on its western slope. We were a free outfit. Even the cook and wrangler were relieved. Their duties were divided among the crowd and almost disappeared. There was a keen rivalry over driving the wagon, and McCann was transferred to the hurricane deck of a cow horse. Which he sat with ease and grace, 
having served an apprenticeship in the saddle in other days. There were always half a dozen wranglers available in the morning, and we traveled as if under forced marching orders. The third night we camped in the narrows between the Missouri River and the Rocky Mountains, and on the evening of the fourth day camped several miles to the eastward of Helena, the capital of the territory. Don Lovell had taken the stage for the capital the night before, and on making camp that evening, Flood took a fresh horse and rode into town. The next morning he and Lovell returned with the superintendent of the cattle company, which had contracted for our horses and outfit on the Republican. We corralled the horses for him, and after roping out about a dozen, which, as having sore backs or being lame, he proposed to treat as damaged and take at half price. The remuda was counted out, a hundred and forty saddle horses, four mules and a wagon, constituting the transfer. Even with the loss of two horses and the concessions on a dozen others, there was a nice profit on the entire outfit over its cost in the lower country, due to the foresight of Don Lovell in mounting us well. Two of our fellows, who had borrowed from the superintendent money to redeem their six-shooters after the horse race on the Republican, authorized Lovell to return him the loans and thanked him for the favor. Everything being satisfactory between buyer and seller, they returned to town together for a settlement, while we moved on south towards Silver Bow, where the outfit was to be delivered. Another day's easy travel brought us to within a mile of the railroad terminus, but it also brought us to one of the hardest experiences of our trip. For each of us knew, as we unsaddled our horses, that we were doing it for the last time. Although we were in the best spirits over the successful conclusion of the drive, although we were glad to be free from herd duty and looked forward eagerly to the journey home, there was still a feeling of regret in our hearts which we could not dispel. In the days of my boyhood, I have shed tears when a favorite horse was sold from our little ranch on the San Antonio, and have frequently witnessed Mexican children unable to hide their grief when the need of bread had compelled the sale of some favorite horse to a passing drover. But at no time in my life, before or since, have I felt so keenly the parting between man and horse as I did that September evening in Montana. For on the trail an affection springs up between a man and his mount, which is almost human. Every privation which he endures, his horse endures with him, carrying him through falling weather, swimming rivers by day, and riding in the lead of stampedes by night, always faithful, always willing, always patiently enduring every hardship, from exhausting hours under saddle to the suffering of a dry drive. And on this drive, covering nearly three thousand miles, all the ties which can exist between man and beast had not only become cemented, but our remuda as a whole had won the affection of both men and employer for carrying, without serious mishap, a valuable herd all the way from the Rio Grande to the Blackfoot Agency. Their bones may be bleaching in some coulee by now, but the men who knew them then can never forget them or the part they played in that long drive. Three men from the ranch rode into our camp that evening and the next morning we counted over our horses to them, and they passed into strangers' hands. That there might be no delay, Flood had ridden into town the evening before and secured a wagon and gunny bags in which to sack our saddles, for while we willingly discarded all our other effects, our saddles were of sufficient value to return and could be checked home as baggage. Our foreman reported that Lovell had arrived by stage and was awaiting us in town, having already arranged for our transportation as far as Omaha, and would accompany us to that city, where other transportation would have to be secured to our destination. In our impatience to get into town, we were trudging in by twos and threes before the wagon arrived for our saddles, and had not Flood remained behind to look after them, they might have been abandoned." There was something about Silver Bow that reminded me of Frenchman's Ford on the Yellowstone. Being the terminal of the first railroad into Montana, it became the distributing point for all the western portion of that territory, 
and immense ox trains were in sight for the transportation of goods to remoter points in the north and west. The population, too, was very much the same as at Frenchman's, though the town in general was an improvement over the former, there being some stability to its buildings. As we were to leave on an eleven o'clock train, we had little opportunity to see the town, and for the short time at our disposal, barber shops and clothing stores claimed our first attention. Most of us had some remnants of money, while my bunkie was positively rich, and Lovell advanced us fifty dollars apiece, pending a final settlement on reaching our destination. Within an hour after receiving the money, we blossomed out in new suits from head to heel. Our guard hung together as if we were still on night herd, and in the selection of clothing the opinion of the trio was equal to a purchase. The rebel was easily pleased in his selection, but John Officer and myself were rather fastidious. Officer was so tall it was with some difficulty that a suit could be found to fit him, and when he had stuffed his pants in his boots and thrown away the vest, for he never wore either vest or suspenders, he emerged looking like an alpine tourist, with his new pink shirt and nappy brown beaver slouch hat jauntily cocked over one ear. As we sauntered out into the street, Priest was dressed as became his years and mature good sense, while my costume rivaled officers in gaudiness, and it is safe to assert two-thirds of our outlay had gone for boots and hats. Flood overtook us in the street and warned us to be on hand at the depot at least half an hour in advance of the train time, informing us that he had checked our saddles and didn't want any of us to get left at the final moment. We all took a drink together, and Officer assured our foreman that he would be responsible for our appearance at the proper time, sober and sorry for it. So we sauntered about the straggling village, drinking occasionally, and on the suggestion of the rebel, made a cow by putting in five apiece and had Officer play it on faro, he claiming to be an expert on the game. Taking the purse thus made up, John sat into a game, while Priest and myself, after watching the play some minutes, strolled out again and met others of our outfit in the street, scarcely recognizable in their killing rigs. The rebel was itching for a monte game, but this not being a cow town, there was none, and we strolled next into a saloon where a piano was being played by a venerable-looking individual, who proved quite amiable, taking a drink with us and favoring us with a number of selections of our choosing. We were enjoying this musical treat when our foreman came in and asked us to get the boys together. Priest and I at once started for officer, who we found quite a winner, but succeeded in choking him off on our employer's orders, and after the checks had been cashed, took a parting drink, which made us the last in reaching the depot. When we were all assembled, our employer informed us that he only wished to keep us together until embarking, and invited us to accompany him across the street to Tom Robbins' saloon. On entering the saloon, Lovell inquired of the young fellow behind the bar, "'Son, what will you take for the privilege of my entertaining this outfit for fifteen minutes?' "'The ranch is yours, sir, and you can name your own figures,' smilingly and somewhat shrewdly replied the young fellow, and promptly vacated his position. "'Now two or three of you rascals get in behind there,' said old man Don, as a quartet of the boys picked him up and set him on one end of the bar, and let's see what this ranch has in the way of refreshment.' McCann, Quarternight, and myself obeyed the order, but the fastidious tastes of the line in front soon compelled us to call to our assistance both Robbins and the young man who had just vacated the bar in our favor. "'That's right, fellows,' roared Lovell from his commanding position as he jingled a handful of gold coins. "'Turn to and help wait on these thirsty Texans, and remember that nothing's too rich for our blood today.' This outfit has made one of the longest cattle drives on record, and the best is none too good for them. So set out your best, for they can't cut much hole in the profits in the short time we have to stay. The train leaves in twenty minutes, and see that every rascal is provided with an extra bottle for the journey. And drop down this way when you get time, as I want a couple of boxes of your best cigars to smoke on the way.' 
Montana has treated us well, and we want to leave some of our coin with you. End of chapter 24 End of the Log of a Cowboy by Andy Adams Recording by Richard Kilmer, Rio Medina, Texas